to the hearing to order. And um, say we're delighted to be joined today virtually by a noteworthy panel of witnesses uh, to discuss with us service transportation infrastructure. Governor Whitmer, uh, Governor Hogan, Mayor Hancock, and Commissioner Sheehan. And we uh, want to welcome uh, each of them to the uh, Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works first policy hearing of the 117th Congress. Here in Washington today, um, as I walked up from the uh, train station, Union Station to the Capitol, couldn't help but notice that the sun has come out. Here the weather forecast, 60 degrees. Thank you, God. After a winter of uh, brutal uh, weather, a week of brutal winter storms. But despite the fact that the sun and the blue skies have greeted us this morning, our country still faces uh, some major, major uh, hurdles, as we all know. While our economy is starting to show, show signs of life, close to 15 million uh, people in the United States remain unemployed, and roughly half of them have given up looking for a job. Across Texas, families are struggling to recover, as we know, from a catastrophic ice storm with over 8 million people, 8 million people still without safe drinking water, the latest tragedy in increasingly frequent uh, extreme weather and climate events of recent years. This comes on the heels of last week's, uh, last year's raging wildfires in California and Colorado, the size of my state. Hurricane force winds in Iowa that flattened a third of this, that state's crops last year. And uh, get this, this is what uh, Bill, uh, rather for uh, John Neely uh, Kennedy told me yesterday. He said, um, uh, every, every 100 minutes, Louisiana loses a football field of land to rising sea levels. Every 100 minutes. If that happened in Delaware, we'd be gone in about a year, you know, but, uh, but they're disappearing in Louisiana as well. But scientists tell us that if climate change is left unchecked, these disasters are not going to get better, they're going to just get uh, worse. A ragey pandemic is, so here's what we face, a ragey pandemic, millions of jobless Americans, a growing climate crisis that demands bold action. The question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Well some good news, and that is, as it turns out, smart investments in our transportation infrastructure will enable us to tackle all three of these challenges. We can improve the conditions of our roads, highways, bridges in ways that create millions of good-paying jobs, lift up our communities, build a more sustainable economy, and improve our air quality for a healthier, more prosperous future for all of us. The American people are counting on us to make this happen. They don't want to hear us talking about what needs to be done. They want us to work together and get it done. As we gather today, less than half of our federal aid highways and bridges are in good condition. Much of our infrastructure is significantly outdated. It was built for different ranges of temperatures, rainfall, and sea levels. In the last 10 years, we've put nearly $19 billion in emergency funds in addition to what we were already providing from the Highway Trust Fund. Poor road conditions and design flaws create safety challenges, too. Motor vehicle crashes are one of the top causes of unintentional lethal injuries in the United States. Pedestrians and bicyclists face particularly grave challenges as roads are too often designed without a safe place to bike or even cross the street. In the last decade, we've seen a 44% increase in pedestrian fatalities on our roads. Think about that, 44% increase in just one decade. And the burdens of poor road conditions are disproportionately shouldered by marginalized communities. Low-income families and peoples of color are frequently left behind or left out by investments in infrastructure, blocking their access to jobs and educational opportunities. So there's a clear need for, modern, for a modernized transportation infrastructure that is safer and more sustainable, while better ensuring that we treat other people the way we want to be treated. Fortunately, our, commitment, our committee has a roadmap that will enable us to meet these needs and more. Last Congress, as many will recall, our committee unanimously reported a bipartisan reauthorization bill that outlined an historic investment in our nation's surface transportation programs. Unfortunately, the full Senate never acted on it, never acted on it. But now we have an opportunity to build on that promise and actually enact a bill that transforms our transportation sector into one that is more innovative, more resilient, and safer, while creating good paying jobs, lots of them. Now let me briefly touch on some of the key policy priorities for our next reauthorization bill that will help make that vision a reality. 
Auto manufacturers are preparing to greatly expand the line of electric and hydrogen fuel of vehicles, but too often drivers lack access to the charging or fueling stations that these vehicles require. America needs to build corridors of charging stations and hydrogen fueling stations across the country. We also have to make it easier for people to walk safely, bike, or take public transit. So driving isn't the only way to get where we need to go. We need to strengthen our infrastructure so that it can withstand the devastating effects of extreme weather and climate change, which we're witnessing, which we're witnessing with alarming frequency. Last year alone, last year alone, natural disasters fueled by climate change cost us over $95 billion in economic damage. Smart planning to make our infrastructure more resilient will save American taxpayers dollars while helping us avoid rebuilding the same infrastructure uh, projects again and again after severe weather events. And as we work with state and local partners, there must be accountability to ensure that federal funds are invested in well-designed projects that expand equity and lift uh, up our nation as a whole. And now the most challenging part of any discussion on transportation infrastructure, how are we going to pay for it? When I was new in the Senate, the, the guy who sat behind me was Ted Kennedy. I didn't know him very well, and one day I suggested maybe we have a cup of coffee. He actually invited me to his hideaway for lunch, which was quite a thrill. I asked him there uh, during lunch, I said, why is it that all these Republicans want you to be their lead co-sponsor on their big bills? Why is that? You're such a big, big liberal Democrat from Massachusetts. Why is that? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, I'm always willing to compromise on policy, never willing to compromise on principle. That's what he said. Always willing to compromise on policy, never willing to compromise on principle. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the principles I hope we ought to be able to agree on in this regard. For one, much of our transportation infrastructure is in sorry shape. Unfortunately, a lot of it's getting worse, not better. This is not something the federal government should do alone. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment. Second principle that I think most of us can agree on is that things worth having are worth paying for. And we can't just continue to put all of our improvements that are needed on our company's uh, credit card, country's credit card. And I suggest that a third principle should be that those of us who use our nation's roads, highways, and bridges have a responsibility to help pay for them. Now, with principles like that, uh, what I hope we'll do is develop a bunch of policies that are consistent with those principles. A growing number of people believe that a national vehicle miles travel approach will eventually fund much of our transportation infrastructure in the not too distant future. Uh, Mary Barr announced that General Motors, as uh, Senator Stabenow knows, that, what is it, by 19, by 2035, uh, they'll not be build, building any more uh, vehicles, road, uh, cars, trucks, vans, powered by uh, a gasoline or, or diesel. Um, that was a wake up call, wasn't it? The reauthorization bill this committee adopted unanimously in the last Congress called for a national VMT pilot for all 50 states. It was a good idea then, and it's an even better idea now. But if vehicle miles travels turns out to be a big part of the future of transportation funding, we're going to need a bridge, or likely several bridges, to get us to that future for the next decade or so. And for that, we're going to be looking to the Finance Committee for help. Some of us serve on that Finance Committee for help in finding the next five-year reauthorization. And the Senate Committees on Banking and Commerce have major roles to play, too. In closing, let me just say, last Congress, EPW, uh, led by example, something uh, we learned in the need. <coughs> they, uh, we unanimously approved our bill to improve uh, uh, our, and expand our service transportation programs. And we did it 14 months, 14 months before the last five-year uh, service transportation reauthorization bill expired. That was one, I think, authored by Senator uh, Anhoff, if I'm not mistaken. It is imperative, however, that this year our sister committees, committees, committees join us now to begin the critical work that needs to be done and to help get it across the finish line and signed into law long before this year, fiscal year, ends. Senator Capito and I, along with our staffs, are already getting to work. Last week, we invited all of our Senate colleagues, not just on this committee, but all Senate colleagues, Democrat, Republican, Independent, to share with us their state's priority poli uh, pri their policy priorities, transportation pri priority policies, with us so we can begin drafting legislation, not this summer, but this spring. And our goal is to mark up our bill and report out of uh, our committee no later than Memorial Day. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to get the, our bill there alone without having uh, some company from the banking community, uh, banking committee, and, uh, and also for the, from the Congress. They've got to do their part as well. And then finance. 
The conversation we're about to have today uh, in this hearing is critical to that effort. The stakes are high, and a lot of people across the country are counting on us to do our jobs in order to better ensure that they'll have the kind of jobs that will enable them to support their own families far into the future. Before we hear from our distinguished panel of witnesses, we're going to have uh, some introductions. And uh, but before we hear those introductions, uh, Senator Capito is going to be recognized for a ranking member for her opening remarks. Let me just say what a joy it has been uh, serving with you in this, uh, this new partnership, and we look forward to, uh, to uh, doing a great work for our, sta our states and for our country. Thank you. Thank you. And I share the, the sentiment, uh, Chairman Carper. We've got a great, great thing going here communication-wise. I, I thank your leadership and your partnership for uh, today's hearing to kick off this process, which I think is important to every member. And I think we, we all tune into the, uh, what we're going to do on a surface transportation bill. Um, I'd also like to thank our witnesses who are going to be with us remotely today. And uh, we look forward to you hearing your perspectives on surface transportation policy and other issues of infrastructure importance to your state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I enjoy our regular conversations uh, on the bill and other important matters before the committee. And I enjoyed your opening statement, particularly talking about, since I serve on commerce as well, I, I, I'm in good position to gig our chairman there uh, and uh, the other committees that need to be so important. I was really encouraged by the conversation that we had last week or I guess two weeks ago now, with President Biden, Vice President Harris, and uh, Secretary Buttigieg on the importance of uh, what we're talking about today. I think the meeting signified a commitment by the administration to, to see that this bill becomes a reality, uh, as this is one of my top priorities as our ranking member. It's also about more than just building our infrastructure. This bill can facilitate a recovery from the pandemic that has devastated our communities and wreaked havoc on our communities and our economy. Transportation infrastructure is the platform that can drive economic growth. It's all American jobs right there, right on the ground, now and in the future, and improve the quality of life for everyone on the safety aspects which you so, um, so well addressed. I'm optimistic we can deliver that bill before the current extension expires on September 30th, and I noted your um, commitment to Memorial Day as a good marker. Our committee has a strong track record of developing these bills in a bipartisan manner. Our former chair can attest to that. Uh, we passed an excellent bill out of committee 21 to nothing in 2019 that represented bipartisan consensus on issues such as climate change and expediting project delivery. We can come together and once again use this bipartisan process to develop a bill that includes priorities from both parties. So I know such a project is what you want as well, Mr. Chairman. Um, from my perspective, a surface transportation author reauthorization bill must, number one, provide long-term investment in our nation's roads and bridges in a fiscally responsible manner without partisan or lightning rod pay-fors. Of course, that would be over in the Finance Committee that could sink a bill. The last thing we want to do is have a bill that getting out of here that doesn't go anywhere. We experienced that last time. We don't want to experience that again. We want to give flexibility to our states, and I think our uh, panelists will, will give us a good idea of that, to, to address unique transportation needs. And we want to keep the federal interest focused on providing a connected network of roads and bridges to assure that all communities and, um, and the economy can thrive. We want to facilitate the efficient delivery of projects, a perennial issue, so that we can improve safety and resiliency of our surface transportation system. And we want to drive innovation. I think that's critical to help pave the way for the system of the future. As we will hear from our witnesses today, certainty of funding, <laughs> consistency of regulations, and flexibility in tailoring investments to suit the diverse needs of state, rural, and urban communities is essential. In West Virginia, for instance, we need additional highway capacity and bridge improvements to improve safety and increase our efficiencies. Quarter H goes through the middle of our state, has one, been one of my biggest West Virginia transportation priorities. I've been working on this throughout my time in Congress. It is the best last piece of the Appalachian Development Highway system needed to better connect West Virginia for interstate and interstate traffic. Our job is to provide a policy and programmatic framework that recognizes the different transportation needs across the country while balancing important national goals. We also need to efficiently deliver projects that improve our roads and bridges. With an average of seven years to complete an environmental impact statement for a highway project, surely everyone can agree that this process should be reviewed and improved upon. So we know time is money. And it, the longer the time, the more money it costs and the less likelihood it actually gets complete. 
We also know to look at other issues that can impact the delivery of projects and create a better process to move forward from uh, concept to completion. For example, removing impediments to constructing reliable high-speed broadband across the country in concert with our road projects. We cannot afford to delay the benefits to states and communities that come from these projects. We should be forward-leaning in tackling the transportation needs not just of today, but those needs of tomorrow. Driving innovation will be critical to supporting the surface transportation system of the future. It will also aid our efforts, efforts to reinvest in our existing system. That includes cutting-edge technologies like the Virgin Hyperloop, which will be tested and certified in Tucker and Grant counties in West Virginia. I'm committed to working on these issues that are important to my friends on the other side of the aisle, and I know they're willing to do the same. There's a lot of common ground from both of our sides. We share the same goal, getting a bill across the finish line that delivers on addressing the transportation needs of our entire nation. I will add, I, I hesitate to do this because we've got a lot of good feeling going here, but to temper my op, op, uh, the lady, op the wait a minute, should uh, I stop oh, now? Time's expired. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. I temper my optimism with a, with a word of caution, uh, particularly when I read this morning the words from the, the, the budget chair in the Senate on the direction this bill may go. The strong bipartisan support that exists for a surface transportation reauthorization bill and other infrastructure, infrastructure legislation should not extend to a multi-trillion dollar package that is stocked full with other ideologically driven one-size-fits-all policies that ties the hands of our states and our communities. I look forward to being a partner in advancing uh, infrastructure legislation in a bipartisan way. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing the testimony. Thank you. Senator Capito, thank you uh, very much for all of your statements. All of I, uh, before we uh, turn to our witnesses to hear from them, we're, I think we're fortunate to have a, a panel of uh, public officials who have all wrestled with the challenges of transportation at the state and local levels. I'm privileged to know several of them, but not all of them. And uh, we're going to hear their testimony in a moment, but let's just start with a few brief introductions. And I'm going to uh, uh, begin by uh, recognizing Senator Stabenow to introduce our first uh, witness from, from uh, her state, her home state, the great state of Michigan. Senator Stabenow, and we're delighted that you're a member of this committee. Delighted. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito. I have great confidence in both of your leaderships and looking forward to really important work uh, in a number of areas. And particularly around surface transportation reauthorization. And thank you for bringing together this distinguished panel to offer their collective insights and perspectives on how to address our nation's pressing transportation needs. And I, I first have to say that I want to thank Governor Whitmer for her outstanding leadership in addressing the COVID pandemic, uh, as well as I know uh, Governor Hogan. I can't imagine more difficult decisions than the ones that you've had to make. Uh, certainly in Michigan, to keep people safe and save lives. Uh, so thank you. And I know, again, Governor Hogan has had the same challenges. I'm very pleased that Governor Whitmer could join us today to speak about investing uh, in infrastructure and what it means to the state of Michigan and to the Midwest and to our country and, frankly, our future. Uh, you have her bio in front of you, but I'd like to add a few additional comments. Governor Whitmer was elected in 2018 in part because of her promise to fix Michigan's aging infrastructure systems. Since being elected governor, she put forward bold proposals to address the condition of Michigan's roads and bridges. She launched the Rebuilding Michigan program to rebuild the state highways and bridges that are critical to our local economy and carry the most traffic. Uh, so I look forward today to hearing her thoughts and ideas on how we are addressing climate change through infrastructure that's creating good paying jobs and leading us to a more sustainable future. So I welcome Governor Gretchen Whitmer from the great state of Michigan. Thank you, uh, Senator Stabenow. Welcome, uh, Governor Whitmer. I know you're out there and we welcome you uh, to uh, our hearing uh, today. It's an honor to have you here. Let me uh, now recognize uh, our friend, uh, Senator Ben Cardin, for another special introduction of our neighboring, uh, neighboring state's governor, uh, Governor Hogan. And uh, uh, Ben, please uh, proceed. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure to welcome Governor Larry Hogan uh, to our committee. Let me just assure uh, our guests that are coming to us virtually that we're in a committee room that is complying with the CDC guidelines. We're distanced apart. 
but Governor Hogan, I'm following your advice and I'm wearing the damn mask. <laughs> for, for those of you who have seen the commercial that he's used, it's been, I think, very effective. And I, I just really want to thank uh, uh, Governor Hogan, Governor Whitmer, for being very clear from the beginning about the seriousness of COVID-19 and the advice that you gave our citizens clearly saved lives. So first, thank you for the leadership that you've shown during this pandemic. We all appreciate it. And uh, we are uh, very much uh, trying to work in partnership. Uh, governor Hogan uh, was first uh, elected in 2014 as the governor of Maryland. As I think most of you know, he became the head of the National Governors Association and in that capacity worked with us in regards to the passage of the CARES Act and in regards to the passage of the December COVID relief package. So thank you very much for, for your work in that regard. We have Team Maryland. We, our congressional delegation works very closely with our governor on the, the needs of our state. And we couldn't have, I think, a more important witness to talk about the transportation needs. Maryland set up many years ago a consolidated trust fund so that we can share the resources in any mode of transportation and use it to be able to advance uh, the transportation needs of our state. It gives us much more flexibility. But I, I know Governor Hogan will share with us the tremendous needs that we have in the state of Maryland, and we need a more robust federal partnership. Yes, uh, 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 Senator Capito, I could talk about the Appalachia Highway Program. We, we need to complete that, and we need resources for that. Or I could talk about the Bay Bridge and the, the eastern part of our state. But when we look at our urban centers, we have desperate equity needs. We need to advance our, our transit in the Baltimore area. It's, it, it's absolutely essential. We had the WMATA system in the Washington area, the Purple Line. We had the uh, uh, concerns in Southern Maryland as far as transit's concerned in regards to rail. Very appreciative that we got an infra grant that allows us to move forward with the Howard Street Tunnel, which is critically important uh, for freight traffic on the East Coast of the United States. But we have passenger uh, rail needs for high-speed rail in order to deal with the gridlocks that we have in our community. Yes, we have bridges that need to be replaced. We have roads that need to be done. We have the I-270 issue. So there's so many issues in our state that we need a more robust federal partnership so that we can deal with the issues Chairman Carper has mentioned, and that is the equities and the climate change and those issues in a way that can be a win-win situation, that we modernize our transportation needs, and we can also deal with our uh, equity and environmental issues. And I'm pleased that Governor Hogan is here to share his wisdom on those issues with our committee. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Cardin. And I, I just want to say, Senator Cardin and I uh, like baseball, and so does uh, uh, Senator Stabenow and maybe some other folks on this panel. Every now and then, Ben will take me with him to see a, an Orioles game. And uh, I'm a huge Detroit Tigers fan, mm -hmm. and I have a baseball signed by uh, Al Kaline, Al Kaline, Mr. Tiger, who grew up and played Sandlot baseball where? Baltimore City. Baltimore. Won the American League batting championship at the age of 21 and uh, passed away last year. Great, uh, great human being. And I have, I have several of these. I could probably do that. But, but in any event, I, I brought my Detroit Tigers hat. And I would just say in my Al Kaline baseball, from where, uh, where Al Kaline started in the sandlots of Baltimore. And that's a little bit of a uh, history lesson that involves all of us. But... Uh, one that I think uh, is uh, maybe worth mentioning at least uh, briefly here today. So I take my hat off to our, our panel today. And uh, uh, again, uh, Governor Hogan, our neighbor across the, uh, the, uh, the water, welcome to, uh, to the, this hearing. We have two other esteemed witnesses on our panel today. Mayor Michael Hancock is joining us from uh, Denver, Colorado, the mayor of Denver since 2011, the decade. And thank you, Mayor, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And we're also fortunate uh, to have Victoria Sheehan, not Sheehan, uh, we have a, a senator named Sheehan, but uh, commissioner of New Hampshire. I wonder if people get that confused, Ben. Uh, I, I bet they probably do up in New Hampshire. But anyway, uh, commissioner, we're delighted you're here to uh, test us, uh, testify with us uh, virtually. Currently the president of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. So I can tell my wife tonight we actually heard from the president, which you don't hear from every day. Our right, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks for your preparation. Thanks for joining us virtually. Governor Whitmer, we're going to start with you, and you may proceed when you are ready. Thanks so much. Thank you all. When this one, welcome one and all. Governor Whitmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and go Tigers. I'm glad to be with you and Ranking Member Capito and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify 
before your first hearing of the 117th Congress. I also want to thank Michigan's own Senator Debbie Stabenow for the kind introduction. I am honored to appear before you today to discuss how investing in transportation and leading on climate change are pathways to economic growth in Michigan and across the country. I want to talk about what is possible if we work together to address the big challenges head on. And I'm glad to be here with my friend, Larry Hogan, who you quoted as saying, wear the damn mask. Well, before that, I was known uh, for running on and getting elected to fix the damn roads in Michigan. And I have to say uh, that we need significant investments in our roads and bridges. Since taking office, my administration has been focused on taking action to build and to rebuild a better Michigan. Our focus on infrastructure has not waned during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I will work with anyone who wants to build up our roads and bridges, including our federal partners. We welcome it. Because without significant investments in infrastructure, my state and our nation will struggle to remain competitive. A total of 43% of Michigan's major roads are in poor or mediocre condition. And approximately 1,000 local bridges are in poor or critical condition. Driving on deteriorated roads and bridges costs Michiganders $4.67 billion annually. That's $659 per motorist. Damaged infrastructure in any area affects personal mobility, affects our safety, and it slows our economic recovery. And so we have a big opportunity in front of us. At the start of my term, I proposed spending $2.5 billion to fix Michigan's roads but we, couldn't, we could not reach a consensus in Lansing. Doing nothing was not an option. So I implemented Plan B, and that is a $3.5 billion bonding program called Rebuilding Michigan to restore our state trunk lines. And this year I proposed $300 million in my budget to begin tackling our backlog of closed or critical condition bridges. Now, the pandemic has had a devastating impact on our transportation revenues, and we desperately need federal assistance. Doing nothing shouldn't be an option at the federal level either, and I'm heartened by the opening comments of today's hearing. We need long-term, sustainable federal sources for our infrastructure. I hope the committee considers the stakes of the moment that we are in as it drafts transportation reauthorization bill this year. But we also need a plan that goes beyond just roads. We need a national vision when it comes to transportation, much like the interstate highway system offered 65 years ago. To build a more equitable economy and tackle climate change, we need your help, your leadership. For too long, there's been a misconception that preparing for the future comes at the expense of economic growth and good paying jobs today. But it's not a binary choice. It's not an either or, it's really a both and. The health of our economy is inextricably linked to the health of our people and our planet. Whether it's a global pandemic or natural disasters caused by climate change, we've seen firsthand how failing to invest in environmental protection and public health can devastate our country. And in industrial states like Michigan, we've lost jobs to automation and modernization. In the past, big changes created winners and losers, and the government didn't get involved until after the fact. This time, we've got to put workers and communities first and ensure that people who are threatened by change are able to benefit from it. Electrification will create jobs, and Michigan is leading in this space. Since I was sworn in in 2019, we've announced over 11,400 new auto jobs and more on the way. We've committed to being carbon neutral by 2050, a goal that is aggressive and means that we're going to have to work together to achieve it. We've got incredible assets like the American Center for Mobility and a 40-mile driverless lane from Detroit to Ann Arbor that Senator Stabenow was a part of announcing. There are great jobs that can be created by new mobility technologies as well, but it's going to require a new set of skills, and that's something where I think we can partner as well. Michigan has earned several names or expressions over the years. We're the state that put the world on wheels, the birthplace of Motown, the arsenal of democracy during World War II. 
In the next century, Michigan is going to be the arsenal of ideas and innovation. At the national level, we have to invest in resilient infrastructure, emerging industries, and transportation. We need policies that will uplift communities that disproportionately impacted by the transition, address environmental justice, and tackle climate change. We can't shrink away from the crises that we face. We've got to go big and be bold. So let's get to work. I thank you so much for having me today, and I'm really looking forward to your questions and, of course, hearing from my fellow witnesses. Glad to be with you. Governor Wimmer, thanks for your uh, testimony. Senator um, Barrasso, who used to sit right uh, right here, where, actually used to sit right here as a chairman until uh, very, very recently. And, uh, but uh, he and I love music, and every now and then we uh, have quips about uh, music. And I'm trying to think of a Motown song that might be appropriate for, uh, for us as we sort of like get ready to uh, get started. And I, would, I don't know if it was the Temps or the Four Tops, but uh, get your motor running, head out on the highway. Get ready, here we come. One of those two probably works. So get ready, here we come. All right, thanks, Governor. And um, thank you also for uh, we're sending us uh, Gary Peters and, and Debbie Stabana, two of our best. Um, all right, again, uh, Governor Hogan, thanks uh, for joining us this morning, and you may proceed with your testimony. Thanks, thanks, Governor. Well, good morning, uh, Chairman Carper, uh, Ranking Member Capito, uh, my team Maryland member, Senator Cardin, thank you, and uh, welcome me members of the committee. Thanks for having me. It's also really good to be with my colleague and friend, Governor Whitmer, this morning. As chairman of the National Governors Association, uh, pre-COVID, uh, I launched a, a national infrastructure initiative, which was focused on repairing and modernizing America's infrastructure in ways that will drive long-term economic growth while addressing short-term recovery needs and uh, that would encourage innovation and efficient approaches to delivering projects that build the transportation networks of the future. For this national initiative, we brought together thought leaders from all levels of government, from business and labor and academia to get their input. And we held a series of stakeholder summits across the country and around the world to tackle an issue that is so fundamental to our economy, our environment, and our way of life. We released a final report with a series of recommendations, including a number related to the reauthorization of a long-term federal surface transportation bill. National Governors Association uh, recommend uh, that states should be granted maximum flexibility to relieve con congestion and to invest in adaptable and innovative solutions with more reliability and certainty of formula funding. To reduce program burdens and improve project uh, delivery, we recommend that the one federal decision policy should be codified uh, for highway projects to establish a two-year goal for completion of environmental reviews and a 90-day timeline for related project authorizations. And we recommend that Congress make investments in resiliency and, and security to allow us to harness the full potential of financing and leveraging private sector investment, which has been critical to our success here in the state of Maryland, where we've taken a balanced approach, an all-inclusive approach to infrastructure. We're moving forward on nearly all of the highest priority transportation projects in every jurisdiction all across our state and investing far more in roads and transit than any other administration in Maryland history. We have over 800 projects totaling $9 billion in roads, bridges, and tunnels currently under construction. We've improved more than 85% of our entire state highway system, invested $150 million in innovative traffic congestion solutions, smart technology, and cutting edge smart uh, signalization networks. We advanced the Purple Line uh, from Prince George's County to Montgomery County in the Washington Capital Region, which, which is a partnership between the federal, state, and local governments and the private sector. And it's the largest P3 transit project under construction in North America. And just last week, we announced the procurement of a developer for the largest P3 highway project in the world to relieve traffic congestion on I-270 and I-495, the Capitol Beltway, and to finally build a new American Legion bridge across the Potomac River. My fellow governors all across America have similar success stories to share. In states throughout the nation, they're upgrading roads, bridges, and mass transit. They're improving airports and ports. 
fixing aging water systems, and expanding rural and urban broadband. Investing in infrastructure is more important than ever as we work to bring the pandemic to an end and to get more people back to work and to build a sustainable economic recovery. As I said recently to President Biden when I was with him in the Oval Office, the governors urged that any major infrastructure effort be bipartisan. Democrats and Republicans, business and labor leaders, all of us believe that infrastructure should be a top national priority. And governors on both sides of the aisle have shown that there are more than enough uh, good common sense ideas where we can find bipartisan support. And we stand ready to work with you in this effort. Uh, together we can rebuild America's infrastructure so that it will once again serve as an example for the rest of the world. And we hope that this hearing will serve as a springboard for real progress. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Governor Hogan, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for your leadership of the, the uh, National Governors Association. Uh, as a former governor, former NGA chair myself, we value very much the, uh, the NGA and uh, look forward to partnering with, uh, with the NGA. You could probably be, uh, play a key role in that, and, and we, uh, we look forward to that. Um, next, you, uh, you, you bet. Uh, next, uh, I want to say, uh, I think our next, uh, on the, uh, can, can continue with the baseball thing on the on deck circle uh, is uh, Mayor Hancock from, uh, from uh, Denver. And uh, it's one of the positions I always thought it'd be fun to have, but uh, maybe yes, maybe no, we'll see. Uh, Mayor Hancock, um, welcome today. Uh, and uh, you're recognized, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the ranking member and uh, committee members. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, first, let me thank you as well for your leadership and for acting on COVID-19 relief in the last Congress. Speaking on behalf of all local governments, we thank you for your tremendous leadership and support. I'm honored to be here with Governors Whitmore and Hogan and with Secretary Sheehan. Um, and now as we address the new Congress, um, the first thing I want to share is that we hope and encourage you to act on the American Rescue Plan uh, to deliver much needed fiscal relief to cities and counties across this country. Uh, we have been, we've been the first responders to this pandemic, uh, our first line of defense for the majority of our citizens in this great country. Uh, but we need your continued help and support, and we thank you for what you've done in the past, and we're encouraged by what we hope you will do in the future. Mr. Chairman, let me recognize your personal efforts on our behalf as well. It's not been lost on us that you have advocated uh, for direct funding to cities and, and counties uh, throughout this effort. And we are greatly appreciative of your efforts. As a former governor, you know all about state and local finance. And we thank you for talking to your colleagues about the challenges we face. And now as we look to build back better, it is about reviving our economy at every level and doing in ways that confront the key challenges before us. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned just recently, recently in this uh, hearing about what both town song might be appropriate for this moment. And I, it got me to thinking as a music uh, fan myself that the song Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell might be appropriate for this theme of building back better. Local governments have recognized there ain't no mountain too high for us, for our residents to make sure that their quality of life is sustained and that we provide safe passage on our roadways. By investing in transportation and other infrastructure, we recognize it's the cornerstone of that effort. Let me speak to the surface transportation specifically, uh, because FAST Act authorization is before you uh, this year. The structure of the FAST Act is sound. It is built on the foundation of the ice teas or ice tea that this committee set 30 years ago and the law can be adapted to confront the challenges we are discussing today. Climate, equity, economic recovery, and innovation. And it can advance recovery uh, in local areas where people and small businesses have been most harmed by this pandemic. My written testimony addresses these challenges in more detail, but I wanna share this message with you all today. We ask you to rely on your local leaders, invest in us, again, there's been no mountain too high for us as we work to address the challenges facing our citizens. We ask you to lean on us, to challenge us, to lead us out 
of this pandemic and help recover our economy. And my re recommendation is simply this, and I recognize this is a pebble in the pond that's going to send a ripple effect and might be contrary to what some of the previous testimony has been. But we believe that one, you need to use the service transportation block grant to accomplish this. Two, we ask you to direct all these flexible resources to local areas, to metro areas like Denver, and to smaller areas working through the states. This expanded commitment means using local leaders to address key priorities in areas where most people live and work. And by investing more in metropolitan areas, cities and counties, where most of our economic output is generated. Today, I offer this division of labor. Keep states focused on intercity and interstate corridors with resources from the National Highway Performance Program. And two, use the surface transportation block grant to local areas to lift the economy for the local level up and accelerate progress on the key priorities before us. Increasing STBG funds to local areas, we believe is the best way to deal with conditions on the ground during the pandemic and after. It is also the best way to move the needle on key priorities before us and put us on the track for transitioning for rescue from rescue to recovery. It's efficient. It means we can address equity and climate much more uh, prudently on the local, local level. Mr. Chairman, this is a seminal moment for federal transportation policy and for broad infrastructure policy. Mayors will be prepared to support this committee as we learn more about the direction you take on a broader infrastructure recovery package. Mayors and other local leaders are ready, willing, and more than capable of delivering for the future. Thank you for this opportunity to join you today, and we look forward to the testimony and your Q&A session. Well, Mayor Hancock, uh, Senator Stapp, and I heard it through the grapevine that you were a big Marvin Gaye fan. I guess you are. Um, the uh, mayors uh, are going to play a big, uh, big, a big role uh, on this legislation as we go forward, and uh, we welcome your participation. But also mayors across uh, the uh, across the country, just as we welcome the involvement of our uh, our governors. So next, our, our fourth witness uh, today on the, uh, on our panel is Victoria Sheehan, uh, Commissioner Sheehan. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us, and please proceed with your statement. Well, good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to appear today and speak to the critical need for timely reauthorization of the federal surface transportation legislation. My name is Victoria Sheehan, and I serve as the Commissioner of the New Hampshire Department of Transportation and as President of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO. So today, it's my honor to testify on behalf of the Granite State and AASHTO, which represents the State Department of Transportation in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. First, allow me to express on behalf of all the state DOTs our gratitude for your leadership on the $10 billion in COVID-19 relief provided last December. We also thank you for your firm commitment to getting the federal surface transportation bill done on time, as well as possibly providing infrastructure funding as part of a future economic stimulus and recovery package. This morning, I'd like to begin by discussing why timely reauthorization of the federal surface transportation programs is so important. New Hampshire, as a small rural state, relies heavily on federal funds to make infrastructure improvements. Any delay, or even worse, a series of short-term extensions would wreak havoc across the country and would impact not just state DOTs, but our partners, which is local governments and the construction industry. Further, a stable federal surface transportation program has become even more crucial as states like my own continue to deal with the loss of state revenue with the impacts of the pandemic. Here in New Hampshire, we use federal funds to complete projects across the state. Projects such as the reconstruction of Route 16 in rural communities like Cambridge, Dummer, and Errol. And to make safety improvements like the intersection of Route 16 and 41 in Ossipee, New Hampshire. We also invest in large scale projects in more urban areas, using the federal program and the funding tools it provides to ensure that major projects are not advanced at the expense of smaller projects in less populated regions of the state. As an example, to complete the reconstruction of Interstate 93 from Salem to Manchester, New Hampshire secured a TIFIA loan. This loan has allowed the Granite State to pledge state revenues to rural paving and bridge work 
and stretch the value of a state gas tax increase that otherwise would have funded only this one large scale project. Now I'd like to talk about how transportation investment can serve as a key economic stimulus to drive a recovery nationwide. A well-performing transportation network allows American families to benefit, both as consumers from lower priced goods and as workers by gaining better access to employment. It also allows businesses to manage inventories and move goods more affordably while ensuring employees can reliably get to and from work. As Congress considers providing additional financial support to stimulate the economy and to recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, AASHTO asks you to provide funding through existing highway and transit formulas, as they provide funding in the quickest, most efficient manner, understood by our state DOTs, and provide funding to every state and locality. It's also important that Congress not attach unrealistic timelines related to the obligation of economic recovery funding. Nor should such funding come with additional federal requirements that delay obligation expenditure of funds. Lastly, as you consider surface reauthorization policies, know that AASHTO strongly supported the bipartisan process this committee used in the last Congress to develop the America's Surface Transportation Infrastructure Act. Based on that foundation of partnership, we believe the next bill's core policy principles should look at the following. First and foremost, like I said earlier, timely reauthorization of the long-term bill. A long-term sustainable revenue solution to the Highway Trust Fund. Increased and prioritized formula-based funding to states. Increased flexibility, reduced program burdens and improved project delivery. And support and ensure state DOTs are able to harness innovation and technology. Meanwhile, our state DOTs will continue addressing ongoing and emerging policy issues such as performance and asset management, infrastructure resiliency, equity, carbon reduction, as well as broadband and other technology deployment in our highway right of way. To conclude, this week, hundreds of state DOT leaders from all corners are gathering virtually at AASHTO's 2021 Washington briefing. While we won't be able to visit with you in person like we normally do, AASHTO and the state DOTs will continue advocating for a strong federal state partnership to address our surface tra transportation investment needs. Thank you again for the honor of being here today and the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Sheehan, thank you uh, very much for your testimony and to, uh, to all of our witnesses today. Uh, it's uh, hard to think of a better panel to begin the consideration of our service transportation bill than, uh, than, this, uh, than this panel. I want to start off, if I, I can, let me just mention so far the, uh, the the num uh, the, I'm going to run through quickly the, the names of uh, those who have uh, either shown up in person or, or uh, virtually. But in, in this order, myself, followed by Senator Capito, Senator Cardin, Senator Inhofe, uh, Senator Sanders, Senator Kramer, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Lemus, Senator Stabenow, Senator Kelly, and Senator Padilla. All right, that's, that's, a start. that's about nine people, too. All right. Uh, let me just start off with a, a quick question of uh, Senator, uh, or rather of uh, Governor Hogan. Governor Hogan, there's a, uh, as you know, the Northeast Corridor runs uh, from uh, down in, uh, by rail, but down to around uh, Washington, D.C., all the way up to Boston. And uh, there's a, a stretch uh, between Aberdeen, Maryland, and Newark, Delaware, uh, where it goes from th three uh, rails to two. And uh, there's been talk for, uh, for a long time about uh, adding a, a third rail between uh, Aberdeen and uh, Newark, uh, Delaware, uh, that is probably about six or seven miles. And is this a project that you've ever heard discussed in Maryland? Is this something that the people of uh, Maryland might be willing to to uh, to uh, collaborate with Delaware and uh, the US DOT on? Senator, I know that our, our Department of uh, Transportation has had discussions, and uh, we certainly uh, look forward to uh, continuing to talk with you about that possibility. I think uh, those bottlenecks where we've gone through this uh, in, in Maryland, we just, uh, we're moving forward on the Howard Street Tunnel, where we moved from uh, into, we could only do single stack trains, and it was a real bottleneck, I think, a similar way. And if you've got uh, you know, multiple lanes, go multiple tracks going into fewer number of tracks, it causes congestion. Uh, we think it's, uh, it's probably something that uh, we'd love to work with you on. All right, thanks, thanks so much. Question, if I could, for Governor Whitmer. Governor, reducing transportation emis emissions is a top priority for reauthorization, and the good news is that the world is moving toward zero emission vehicles. 
A decade ago, the number of electric vehicles on the roads in the United States could be counted in the hundreds. Uh, today, we're approaching 2 million, and it seems that a week doesn't go by that automakers don't announce an increase in ambition. Uh, I mentioned uh, General Motors' uh, announcement that they're has become, uh, what, 2035, that they'll not be building uh, any more uh, gasoline diesel-powered vehicles. Um, the, um, and, but Ford, Ford Motor Company apparently has recently announced that all of the cars that they sell in Europe will be electric by, I think, by 2030. Yet the market forecasts predict that the EV share of new car sales in the U.S. will lag in comparison with uh, Europe and China. And I'm concerned that if the U.S. lags on EV policy, investments in manufacturing will flow to other parts of the world. My question, Governor Whitman, is how do we ensure that U.S. consumers are purchasing zero emission vehicles, and what are the perils of ceding our leadership here to other nations? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question, and at the risk of uh, taking this Motown question too far, I think Dancing in the Streets by Martha Reeves and the Vandellas might be the right uh, song for this undertaking. Hopefully, that means we're successful in it. Um, I think you're asking a very important, thoughtful question as uh, we are trying to transition our economy and our consumption, address climate change and our workforce needs as well, and do it equitably. Um, this is uh, an important part of the conversation. You know, in Michigan, our economy is inextricably linked to the auto industry and the future of mobility and our decarbonization goals um, all need to be uh, woven together so that we can tackle um, emissions. Now we've got to invest in um, and push for bold electric vehicle policy as a pathway to economic opportunity for our country and a way to address climate change. These are our link. They, you can't pull them apart. It's not if or, it is both. And um, we're heavily focused on uh, building a statewide connected charging network in Michigan. We're working to help communities and businesses transition their fleets and ensuring that we've got tools to attract and retain um, electric vehicle employers and to reskill our workforce. All of these are important pieces of it. Um, you know, we have, have, I'd like to highlight just one quick thing. Uh, my state's Office of Future Mobility and Electrification, uh, our effort is called, you know, we've got one of our efforts is called Flip Your Fleet. And it's a $3 million program aimed towards small businesses and school districts that we proposed um, in the Mobility Futures Initiative in my fiscal year 22 budget. So thinking creatively about how do we incentivize this transition? How do we upskill our workforce so that we're prepared? Um, how do we build up the infrastructure across the state so that when you buy your EV that is American made, um, that you're able to, to utilize it and, and have confidence in that. And so these are all important pieces to incentivizing this um, investment and these, this American transition um, that I think we're gonna need to partner at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, as the mayor was speaking to. And I think um, these are all aspects of being successful to doing that. Governor, it's encouraging to hear uh, you uh, tell us of the role, uh, the leading role that um, the state of Michigan is playing toward beginning to uh, create this uh, corridor of charging stations and, and fueling stations. Uh, Senator uh, Kelly is a retired Navy captain, a pilot, astronaut, and uh, he knows we have a saying in the Navy, uh, all hands on deck. And when it comes to creating these corridors of charging stations and fueling stations, it really is all hands on deck. It's just not all in the federal government. It's not all on state and local governments. It's not all on um, the state departments of uh, transportation. It's not all on um, the convenience stores of the world, the Wawa's. And it's uh, it's uh, it's all on, it's, it's, a, it's a burden that we all carry, but it's an opportunity that we all share. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Governor. And uh, next, uh, I think we uh, turn to uh, my colleague. Thank, thank you all. Member. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my first question is to Governor Hogan, our neighbor to the north uh, of West Virginia. We are, um, your western part of Maryland is, we often say it's just West Virginia again, or maybe you would say, maybe our our part of our state is, is Western Maryland, but we're very much tied to one another. And I know that's where you have your Appalachian Development Highway System that uh, Senator Cardin talked about. We've been working together. My question really is aimed at, because you have, you know, you talked about the congestions in, in Baltimore and you have massive transportation challenges in, in your more populated area, but then as you move to Western Maryland, you have the rural areas. What do you see in terms of being able to meet the transportation of 
that we need to put in this bill to make sure the that you as the governor have the ability to meet the transportation needs of both your rural and urban areas. And I do want to thank you for mentioning the one federal decision. We thought that was a, uh, a very good part of our of the last bill that we passed, and we hope to incorporate it into this one. So, uh, Governor Hogan, could you uh, talk about the rural-urban flexibilities that you yeah. need? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. It is great to have you as, as a neighbor. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the, the flexibility is something that I think we agree on, that the states need to uh, uh, to, to have that ability to, to be flexible, but it's also really important that we balance, that we, uh, that we address issues in both our rural and our urban and suburban communities. And that's what I mentioned earlier, what we've tried to do in a very balanced plan by moving forward on every priority project in every one of our jurisdictions from Western Maryland to the Eastern shore. Uh, we've done some really big uh, projects in the, in the urban areas, but some really important projects in all of our rural areas as well. And I think it's critical that we come up with a, uh, a, a certainty of, of, of a funding formula that gives us flexibility uh, on, on surface transportation dollars rather than, um, you know, some prescriptive regs uh, regarding uh, exactly how we have to use, I think, uh, new discretionary grant programs uh, that could be awarded through other entities. But we look forward to uh, working with you. There's no question we have to find a balance. And going back to my comments earlier about, uh, about getting a bipartisan bill, I think if we want to get everybody on board, we've got to address uh, the transportation and infrastructure needs of, of uh, all the states and all the communities across the country. So let me just, as a point of clarification here, in terms of the, the, the formula funding that's built into all of these bills uh, that as, as we've moved along the five or six year in increments, we have from time to time earmarked certain parts of that formula for certain specific types of projects like transportation enhancement projects and others. Uh, is basically what you're saying is don't take away from the formula money where you have the greatest flexibility as the governor to create uh, new discretionary programs that might take from your ability to be able to make those decisions at the state, local, and municipal level? That's, That's exactly right, right Senator. We, we agree with that. And, we, and it's hard with, with the discretionary funding, it's hard to make long-term planning decisions. Um, it, it, we, we, you know, this transportation projects uh, happen over a long number of years, and for us to really a plan for all the the uh, improvements we want to make to have some type of certainty is is better uh, having flexibility to do with what we want but a reliability and a certainty of the funding formula uh, is is something that the governors would prefer thank you thank you uh, commissioner Sheehan, you mentioned in your statement uh, about the uh, it, the failure to act if we fail to act what consequences or if we do another short term could you expound on that a little bit on our failure to to get to a a lengthy bill, a very robust lengthy bill, as opposed to uh, kicking the can down the road for another year, what impacts that has on you as a state commissioner and as all states? So thank you for that question, Senator. As transportation professionals, we work closely with communities to understand what their transportation needs are. And then we set forth and develop either five-year or 10-year transportation plans. We make some assumptions around what federal funding will be available in the case of New Hampshire, for our 10-year plan, we assumed level federal funding into the future. That's so that we can prepare the projects and have them ready to access dollars uh, when you make them available. So any interruption in the federal program means that we lose an entire construction season potentially if we're dealing with short-term extensions and having to really meter uh, the projects that we advertise and move into construction. So it's very concerning for the state DOT that directly impacts state and local government, um, as well as all of the contractors and vendors that we do business with. They're staffing up and preparing uh, to bid on all of the work that they see us um, advancing through our advertising programs. And when we don't have the financial resources, it's devastating to uh, those sectors of our economy as well. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Senator Capito. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and let me thank all of our witnesses for their presentation. I want to follow up on Senator Capito's point, uh, dealing with the topic of our he hearing, building back better, investing in transportation, fostering economic growth. So if I could, Governor Hogan, start first about your thoughts about how we can tailor this transportation program to deal with challenges in our urban center. And I specifically mentioned Baltimore City. 
I'm aware of one major transportation request we have in for Baltimore City in regards to the I-95 uh, exit for Port Covington. But it seems to me that in many respects, it's more challenging to use public-private partnerships in urban centers. And for a city like Baltimore, that really doesn't have a rapid rail transit system. It has two lines, but not a system. The transit development has become more challenging. So as we look at reauthorizing a transportation program, do you have thoughts as to how we can make it more attractive for transportation to assist economic growth in cities like Baltimore? Thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, I, I do think that we have to uh, focus on on uh, looking at every mode of transportation. Uh, I'm a big believer in a balanced transportation system that uh, it, it, we've invested $14 billion in transit in both the Baltimore and the Washington uh, region. And we, we redid the, uh, the entire bus system in Baltimore, hundreds of millions of dollars. We run the transportation system for Baltimore City. Um, there's no question that, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we did a P3 uh, on the Purple Line in the Washington suburbs. You, you, you could do the same thing in Baltimore. The, the, the previous plan was just one line that didn't really provide any kind of a system. Uh, but you'd have to make it attractive to the private sector. We'd have to have the flexibility of funding. Uh, it, but we, uh, you know, we've invested money to save the Washington Metro system, to build the Purple Line, and to redo the transit system in Baltimore. But there's no question that as we try to come out of this, uh, this pandemic and we head into economic recovery, particularly in some of our urban areas, uh, investment in infrastructure can help us create more jobs. Uh, just on the uh, on the road project in uh, Metropolitan Washington on the Capitol Beltway and uh, fixing the uh, the bridge, uh, that's going to provide 11,000 jobs for every billion dollars invested in that project, and it's uh, going to be about a 10 billion dollar project. So there's no question that this is going to be a, a big part of our economic recovery, and it's why uh, we've got a number of uh, labor uh, groups that are just as excited as some of the business entities and the state and local governments. There's no question we have uh, an aggressive program for the Washington area uh, dealing with both transit and roads. Uh, I find Baltimore has challenges that have not yet been met. So I would just welcome your thoughts as we go through the process as to what incentives we can put into a transportation reauthorization that makes it easier for urban centers themselves, not necessarily suburban areas, but the centers themselves to be able to attract uh, economic growth. Mayor Hancock, I'd like to ask you a question and following up on Senator Capito. I'm the author of the Transportation Alternative Programs that gives flexibility on the use of transportation funds for local government units so that they can deal with their needs and have some ability to deal with uh, uh, pass, uh, bike pass, uh, tra uh, bike safety, tourism type transportation needs, et cetera. Can you just tell me uh, how important is it for a mayor of a major city to have some flexibility on the use of transportation money coming from the federal government and not have to solely rely upon the allocation and uh, partnership with the state? Senator, your, your questioning is so on target with what most mayors across this country are dealing with and are asking uh, for with regards to our plan. Uh, from the U.S. Conference of Mayors to the United States Congress and to the Biden administration. Local governments have the ability to be much more nimble with uh, their ability to address the challenges facing uh, their residents. Here's the reality. 80% of all the roads that, that uh, we as citizens travel on are sitting in front of our homes. They're sitting in front of our small businesses. It's the roads that we use to get to work every day. Um, and, and, and yet we are only seeing a, a small portion of the resources that are coming to our states, to particularly our metro uh, urban centers. You mentioned Baltimore. Denver is not much different, as well as the other large metropolitan areas in the state of Colorado, uh, mainly down south of Colorado Springs and here in the metro Denver area. We could take those resources and create the multimodal roles that we feel we need to do and, and address the issues around equity, again, climate change that we have put forth as priorities. If we had greater flexibility and more resources directed to city governments, uh, I think you'll see us move much more efficiently to address the overwhelming infrastructure challenges that face, again, 80% uh, of the roads that uh, our people are traveling on every day. And let me just mention this. Post-pandemic is going to mean that we're going to have a different culture, work culture in this country. 
Um, we believe that most people are going to have a rotational basis of working remotely and then in person. Um, you're going to see small businesses who have been disproportionately harmed working to try to come back and recover as quickly as possible. I think the faster and more efficient way for us to address the roads will help everybody get to a better uh, state of recovery in the next economy. And that's going to be critically important. We won't have time, as a uh, ranking member talked about, bogging down municipalities in bureaucracy and, and, and having the, this, uh, this uh, intermediary of the state again playing a role. Although the state is, and I'm going to say, the states have been great partners, but we can move much more efficiently and be more nimble and accountable in moving forward with these road improvements that we have to have, being more multimodal, and again, addressing the issues of climate equity and, and improvement uh, on a much more uh, fast track basis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Senator uh, Cardin. Uh, now, uh, Mayor, uh, another former mayor, and the uh, mayor of Tulsa, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. who's uh, led right. this committee, led the Armed Services Committee, and uh, knows a thing or two, having authored a major legislation for years on t transportation. Well, it's been a and joy working with a lot of the people who have been leaving right now and the rest of us here. This is really what we're supposed to be doing. The two most important things are defending America and infrastructure. At least that's what the... Um, but I've always believed. Real quickly, I have a couple of uh, UCs I want to propose at this time. One would be, I have a, I wrote an uh, op-ed piece in the Washington Times this morning having to do with the uh, bipartisan necessity that we're going to be dealing with right now to have a successful bill and I ask for unanimous consent. That may be made a part of the record. Uh, without objection. And I have a second one. It's a letter submitted by the National Association of Drug st uh, Truck Stop Operators uh, stressing the, the urgency for senators to protect the ban on commercializing interstate or rest areas. It's kind of the old-fashioned idea that the public, private sector does things better than the public sector does. I would ask you to set that. I'm going to have to record. object to that one. And the... Uh, <laughs> Without objection. All right. Uh, the um, second thing, we've done some really good work uh, on, on this committee. Uh, on the last Congress, we tackled something that had not been successfully addressed before, and that was on streamlining, not talking about it, but actually streamlining it. Uh, it we, we had a committee report a bipartisan highway bill with the needed streamlining provisions, including uh, codifying the one federal decision process. And uh, Governor Ho Hogan, you come from a perspective of not just your own personal experience, but also chairing the uh, National Governors Association. And there are people talking about now, some people not on this committee, but uh, individuals saying, well, we've already done the streamlining. We did that last year, and we don't need to do any more. And so I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you respond to that, and how do project delivery delays affect the investments that are made by the states and the federal government? Governor Hogan. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, first of all, let me uh, let me again agree with you the, on the importance for uh, for reaching a, a bipartisan solution to this. I think it is if we can't reach a bipartisan solution on something like infrastructure, where that everybody agrees is a priority, then it's going to be difficult to do that on anything else. But um, you're you're right. Enhancing efficiency and eliminating red tape, uh, making the process uh, go smoother, cutting the time frames down. Uh, will um, uh, will be very important to continue to make progress on. There was some progress made, uh, but it's uh, it's still much too long, much too confusing of a, of a process that adds cost. It, it adds time frames. You know, time is money. Uh, we don't get these projects moving forward. We're not solving the infrastructure needs, the transportation problems. But it's also costing taxpayers a lot more money because of the delays. And when we're dealing with private sector investment, which uh, we're doing a lot of. Uh, you know, it, taking the, some of the risk uh, out of the process by having some certainty about how long it's going to happen, I think, is important. Uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, the one federal uh, decision pol policy should be codified. We should establish a two-year uh, goal for completion of environmental projects and a 90-day timeline for related project authorizations. I mean, 
the uh, at the beginning of the discussion, somebody was talking about the seven year time frame that it takes to go through the environmental process. You know, we all want to make sure that we uh, very carefully uh, in, ensure the safety of our environment and that we go through and not not skip any steps or uh, but we have to speed, uh, you know, do things simultaneously, concurrently and speed the process somehow. It's going to mean a lot to doing more projects, putting more people to work. Um, okay. and, and making improvements to this. Yeah. To, uh, I appreciate all, all that very much. Uh, uh, needs. You, you brought up, and, uh, and I think it's significant, too, that we keep in mind. Well, first of all, I've never seen a five-year program that can't be done in one year. And we demonstrated that real clearly, I think, in the last two bills that we had, and we're on the right road there. But also, you brought up this idea of prioritizing. I think that um, we've done a really good job in Oklahoma. Uh, we were prioritizing prior to the last two uh, 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 bills that we had, Oklahoma had been number, a lot of people don't know that they rank us in terms of uh, the conditions of our bridges. And we were number 49 in the, in the country on the condition of our bridges. And we, uh, as a result of the efforts that we did, uh, we were now our, our number nine. And we've gone all the way from 49th to number nine in the condition of our bridges. We have some 1,600 bridges in the state of Oklahoma. So I think that the important thing here, and I would ask you to respond to this also, uh, Governor, or oh, both governors, uh, that the significance of having the states be the movers of the priorities. You know, a lot of times people would rather the federal government do that. So uh, states should determine the priority of surface transportation within their boundaries. What do you think? I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Senator. Um, and we even do that at the state level. We we get input from the local each of the local governments on what their priorities are. And then as a state, uh, we try to take those priority uh, considerations in as we're putting together our state transportation plan. Uh, for the, by the, the same way we we go with our uh, Senator Cardin can tell you when we meet with our federal delegation we lay out here these are the priorities of our state uh, and I, you know we're the ones on the ground that can make those decisions get more input uh, and uh, you know I think it would be uh, we obviously you know we we uh, we want to work together with our federal partners but the states can help uh, prioritize there's no question about that we, there's a lot of need and we can't do everything at the same time we want to make sure that we all agree on the priorities. Well, my time has expired, but I'd ask to, uh, for the record, you send something to us, Ms. Sheehan, about your workforce development thing. We've been very active on this, not just in roads and highways. We have provisions in the FAA bill. on, uh, and, uh, and so just if you could, for the record, send us something as to what we could do, Congress, to help in that area of workforce development, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. So, thank you, uh, Sen Senator Inhofe. Uh, another former ma mayor, not everybody thinks of Senator Sanders as a former mayor, but he was mayor of uh, Burlington, he's a congressman, and now a senator, run for president a couple of times, and, and he's uh, in the Yondek uh, circle. And he's joined us by WebEx uh, today, uh, but uh, Senator Sanders, you're recognized if, if, if you're able well, to join us. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of our panelists who are with us. Uh, I don't know that I have anything um, profound to offer that hasn't been said already. Uh, what I can tell you is that in a rural state like Vermont, we are struggling big time uh, with crumbling roads and bridges. Uh, we waste a lot of money just trying to uh, rebuild rather than maintain uh, our roads, which is just you know throwing good money after bad. Uh, and as everybody has said, uh, we have the potential now as we rebuild our roads and our bridges our water systems, our wastewater plants, our public transportation. We are behind many other countries around the world in terms of rail. Uh, and we are also focusing on climate change, uh, the need to transform our energy system, which means, among any uh, uh, other things, a whole lot of charging stations throughout rural America. Uh, as we do all of those things, we can create millions of good paying jobs, make our economy far more efficient uh, save lives, have safer transportation. So just, uh, Mr. Chairman, all that I wanted to say uh, is count me in. This is a problem impacting urban America, but it is also a problem 
impacting rural America. And I do say this uh, in a very divided uh, political climate in this country. Uh, I think we can come together at least on this issue. Uh, whether you're a Republican governor or a Democratic governor, you got problems with your infrastructure. So let's uh, go forward together, create the jobs, rebuild our infrastructure, and do the right thing for the American people. Senator Sanders, thank you very, very much for that uh, for that message and for joining us today. Next, uh, I think uh, uh, Senator uh, Kramer, I think you're up. I have uh, to return a phone call. I'll be right back. And, and meanwhile, uh, Senator Capito, you're in charge. Oh boy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Senator Capitol. Thank both of you for your leadership on this important issue, both in the last Congress and and uh, now in this one. Um, and thank all of the witnesses for your expert testimony and uh, your thoughtfulness today and for being with us today. Um, Commissioner Sheehan, I, I don't know if you know North Dakota's uh, commissioner, um, but we feel really blessed in North Dakota to have lured uh, away from uh, away from the mountains of Wyoming to the prairies of North Dakota, uh, Bill Panos, who's, who's doing a great job. And in every discussion I have with uh, Bill, he, of course, brings up an issue that has been alluded to a number of times today, and that is, of course, the formula. Um, but North Dakota, being uh, very rural, much like Wyoming, much like parts of your, your some of these states that we're talking about today, I think every state has some part of it that's rural, but North Dakota is very rural. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the importance, Commissioner, of, of the formula remaining the way it is, why it is so important for, for the entire system to maintain this formula? Well, thank you for that question, Senator. And yes, I know um, the head of the DOT in North Dakota, Bill Panos, well, he's one of my colleagues at ASHTO. Um, the reason that states advocate strongly for formula funding is that provides predictability into the future. <clears throat> As we advance our project, we want to have certainty that the commitments that we're making to municipalities and counties, we can truly deliver on. And in rural areas in particular, those formula dollars are being used each and every day to make lasting improvements in the infrastructure. Whether that's replacing deficient bridges, working to improve pavement condition, making safety improvements, or ensuring that our infrastructure is resilient to an increase in future uh, extreme weather. And so um, we as state DOTs continue to emphasize the need for that traditional funding. While in addition, you might look at increasing some of the other programs um, that could benefit uh, communities more directly. We would not want to see those efforts move forward at the expense of the core program. Thank you for that. So along the lines of funding, and obviously a lot of the discussion here that takes place here deals with the funding and there's never enough to do all the things we should do. However, um, one of the things is, uh, the other things, uh, Commissioner, that ASHTO has advocated for is a sustainable funding source. So th the Highway Trust Fund obviously being the main source um, for infrastructure development, surface transportation development. Um, you've advocated for that sustainable sustainability of that, and yet Governor Whitmer is understandably and appropriately proud of the work that um, the manufacturing sector is doing and creating more electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. And of course, the, the, um, that ambition for that type of climate response and a sustainable formula or form, um, revenue stream obviously intersect and conflict at some point. Could I ask each of you, Governor Whitmer and um, Commissioner Sheehan, to, to talk about what a future funding source would look like in terms of um, the revenue stream, please? Maybe Governor Whitmer first. I'll start. Thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. Appreciate it. You know, I knew that eventually this conversation will go to this part, and I know that's also the hard, tough job that you all have ahead of you. Um, I know it's a long debated question of talking about the solvency of the highway trust fund and how to pay for needed transportation investments. And I'm not here to answer the question on the federal gas tax. I can only speak from what I know. After decades of underinvestment in Michigan, um, the people of my state elected me. One of my big tasks that I heard all across the state in all 83 counties was to fix the damn roads. <laughs> and my team and I looked at all the options as we came in to improve the funding outlook in Michigan. There's no question we need predictable, 
sustainable and sufficient uh, solution that is the best case scenario. When I took my solution to the legislature, we couldn't find common ground, and so I had to pivot and do bonding. Because we know that doing nothing is not an option. And as you know, uh, festering infrastructure problems get harder to tackle and get more expensive. And so um, I know that you are going to have this debate about where, how we prioritize this and, and make this a reality. And I look forward to that debate and happy to share any thoughts that we have from the ground of, of how we can improve the, 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 the tenor and the substance of that debate. Thank you. Commissioner Sheehan, do you have some thoughts? So, uh, Senator, thank you for the question. I, too, don't envy you um, the, the challenging um, work that you have ahead of you to, to identify a sustainable source of revenue for the Highway Trust Fund. We are having similar conversations at the state level, and our state legislature is hesitant to move towards a new source of revenue without understanding what direction the federal government might move in. But what I do know is that uh, since the last gas tax increase, um, our cost of doing business has continued to increase, and we have lost buying power over the last 28 years. And so we truly appreciate the efforts of the Congress to identify a sustainable solution. And when highway trust fund receipts have not kept pace with the investments that we need to make, and the fact that there has been other sources of revenue made available so that we could continue our programs, that's extremely um, important to states, and we appreciate that continued uh, support for transportation investment. Thank you, uh, Senator Kramer. Um, Senator Whitehouse is, I think, joined us by WebEx. Uh, Sheldon, you're out there somewhere. Please join us. It's, uh, you're recognized. Yes, I am, and uh, thank you. I'm delighted to have this terrific panel of witnesses. I wanted to um, talk first about uh, coastal infrastructure. Um, and uh, Governor Whitmer, Michigan counts because the way we define coastal includes our uh, Great Lakes. Uh, but it's estimated that coastal communities are going to need to invest more than $400 billion in the next 20 years. And that's based on our present um, very conservative and probably inadequate estimates of the damage that climate change uh, portends through sea level rise and um, extreme weather. This is a new and very um, alarming demand for these local communities. And um, as we look around at the places for uh, support for coastal communities, we look at things, uh, particularly in this committee, like the Army Corps of Engineers Flood and Coastal Damage Reduction Fund. And what we see in the last decade is that in our best year, $19 went inland for every single dollar that went to coasts. That was our best year in the last decade. In our worst year, $120 went inland for every single dollar that went to coasts. Um, everybody's familiar with the Land and Water Conservation Fund that has a less egregious but similar bias towards inland and upland projects over coastal projects. Uh, CoreLogic has done its 2020 storm surge report and it estimates that over 7 million single family homes are at risk of storm surge in the US and that the cost to rebuild those homes would exceed over exceed $1.7 trillion. So we have a big coastal problem on our hands. It is a coastal problem that we are uh, ignoring the uh, chairman comes from a state that is similar in size to Rhode Island um, and has even lower topography. So Delaware and Rhode Island share a very strong concern about uh, these issues. And uh, we were able to get into the last uh, highway bill that came out of um, our committee unanimously, some very good work on coastal infrastructure because it's not just going to be homes that are flooded, it's also going to be infrastructure. And where the infrastructure goes, uh, you can also lose homes and access to emergency services to homes. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And I would like to ask uh, the governors, 
um, to comment on what they see as the needs in their states to protect coasts. I think Maryland is more immediately affected uh, because of the oceans problem, uh, but Michigan and the Great Lakes have their own issues as well. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, thanks for raising the issue. Um, you know, we, we, a lot of the discussion uh, around uh, climate change is about uh, mitigation uh, and about clean air and not enough, uh, I think, discussion about how we mitigate some of the problems that are going to be caused by by flooding. And as you as you just uh, touched on very eloquently, the coastal flooding issue. Um, we we did touch on this, and our a lot of our focus was on transportation uh, infrastructure uh, during the NGA uh, initiative. But we did talk about resiliency uh, and uh, trying to address uh, some of these issues. And in our state, along with like Governor Whitmer said earlier, uh, you know we've made great strides in, in uh, with respect to climate change. We have t cleaner air standards than 49 other states. We put tax credits in for. Uh, electric vehicles and charging stations and taking a lot of actions on mass transit to get people off the roads. Uh, but this is one we have invested some dollars in, but it's you're right, there's been not enough funding. It's something we do have to address as you're looking at infrastructure. Uh, flood, coastal flood, not just coastal flooding, but further up upstream uh, flooding uh, is going to occur as well. And uh, as a, coast, a small coastal state adjacent to the chairman's uh, state of Delaware, uh, it's obviously a, an issue and a concern for us with the Chesapeake Bay, which is one of uh, America's uh, greatest natural resources. It's an issue that we we deal with, and uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to my colleague to, to weigh in, but the, it's, a, and it's an important issue we have to address. Yeah, uh, thanks, Governor Hogan and, and Governor Whitehouse. Thank you so much for the the question. I think that it's really important, and I'm glad that you highlighted the coastline in Michigan. We have 3,200 miles of coastline in Michigan, all fresh water. 21% of the world's fresh water is in and around the Great Lakes. Um, so this is something that we take very seriously and we have seen the impact of climate change. We need to address this through resilient infrastructure. Um, high water levels have eroded our shorelines and washed away roadways and we've had devastating flooding in communities that have forced evacuations. We need to evacuate 10,000 people in Midland, Michigan, that wasn't along the Great Lakes, but it was just another example of the need for resilient uh, infrastructure because it washed out a number of dams and bridges when that 500 year flooding event happened. So whether it is um, in Texas or it is in the freshwater coastline of Michigan or along the, the nation's uh, borders with the all across the country, this is something that is of critical importance. You know, when um, we see high water levels that are eroding our shorelines, they're impacting everything from our drinking water to just our ability to, um, you know, conduct life and, and be safe in doing that. And so um, we have got, I think, a lot of needs in this area, but there's no question that resilient infrastructure along the coastlines is an important part of the overarching problem that we're, we're hopeful that, that you will help us address. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I am probably close to out of time, if not completely out of time. So let me just let uh, Governor Whitmer know that <clears throat> as the fix the damn roads governor and as the uh, auto governor with GM having made these commitments to going to all electric vehicles, um, we have in the bill that we passed uh, significant support for electronic vehicle charging infrastructure. And we're eagerly trying to get tax support for electronic vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, and as you know, it's gonna be a very bad thing for GM if they commit to electric vehicles and we haven't built the infrastructure to charge those electric vehicles. So we are on the case, but we need your help and the help of our Republican colleagues to make sure that that all gets done aggressively and energetically. All right. Thank you. Senator, Senator White, asked something you just said it reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, one of uh, Senator Stabenow's constituents, Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors, and we were talking a year ago about um, the uh, what it was going to take to convince consumers in this country to buy uh, electric-powered vehicles and hydrogen-powered vehicles. And she said, with respect to EV, she said, "I need we need three things to convince our customers to buy them uh, if we're going to build them. And uh, she said, first thing we need is 300-mile range on a charge. We've got that now. You said the second thing we need is um, charging stations. 
across the country, quarters across this, for both for electric and hydrogen vehicles. And the last thing she said that uh, that he needed is the technology to enable him to charge uh, batteries in minutes, not hours. And like we're knocking on those doors, the one thing that we ne really need though is number two, to your to your point, Sheldon. So. Gentlemen, we are uh, your your statement, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and driving one. Anybody who's had the pleasure of driving an electric oh, vehicle knows what fun. a thrilling experience it is. Yeah, they're fun. They're a lot of fun. The um, our states may be st a small Sheldon, but we uh, punch above our weight. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think uh, Senator Lummis is next, and uh, Lummis. People ask me how do how do you pronounce her name, and I tell them Lummis is in hummus. I hope I've got that right. Senator Lummis, welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Really appreciate uh, this topic. Uh, it's so important to my state of Wyoming. My first question is uh, for Mayor Hancock and for uh, Victoria Sheehan. Thank you both for being here. Uh, greetings, Mayor. I'm from your state to the north, Wyoming. Uh, and spent a lot of time in, in your beautiful community. Um, so my question for both of you is, uh, it's related to uh, Senator Kramer's question earlier. He asked about the importance of the formula. My question is about the flexibilities within the formula funds. How important are the flexibilities in formula funds to ensure the varying needs of states can be met with federal dollars, uh, given how very different uh, the needs are of our states and our communities. Senator Lamas, first of all, you know, as we, we like to say here between Colorado and Wyoming, there's almost, we forget the boundaries that we consider you family. So it's an honor to, to meet you, uh, at least virtually. Um, and I appreciate your question because I think you get to the heart of um, the real opportunity before all of us um, as we try to think about what the future investments around transportation and infrastructure looks like, how we address the, the looming challenges of climate and equity uh, going forward. Uh, cities in particular have to have flexibility because we better understand the nuances uh, of our communities and really the challenges that so many in our community face. I often say when I talk about transportation and mobility, if you want to know where poverty exists, I would, I, I would show me where the least number of options around mobility exists, and I'll show you poverty. Um, and that's been true no matter where you are in this country, rural or urban, um, suburban, doesn't matter. The reality is, is that we've got to be able to adjust to the flexibilities. And that's why, as mayors, we have proposed um, utilizing some of the tools within uh, the federal government working with our states and municipalities today, whether they are STBG or the, the CBG, or even renewal of the uh, energy efficiency block grant so that we can be much more um, facilitative and flexible in addressing the challenges that face. Uh, so many of our communities have been perennially overlooked and underserved. Um, we get a chance to provide those ladders of opportunity to bring multimodal options to those communities to make sure that we're able to create connectivity and to create affordable housing, um, good schools, access to good health care, um, and particular transportation corridors and to lift them, uh, give them opportunity to be lifted out of poverty. So the, the, the flexibility within the formula is critical, and I'm glad you landed on that, and it just shows a great deal of insight coming from a Wyoming cowboy, our cowgirl. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, Ms. Sh uh, Sheehan, on behalf of ASHTO, would you make some remarks on that same subject? Thank you, Senator. So as state DOTs, we are advancing projects that fulfill numerous goals, and that's why flexibility is so critical. For example, if we're replacing a bridge that's structurally deficient, we may be replacing that bridge with a longer structure that is more resilient and can handle an increase in storm frequency. We also may be widening, not to increase capacity, but to provide more amenities uh, for active transportation, whether that's sidewalks or um, bike lanes or wider shoulders, depending on that unique situation. And so as we advance the projects, the flexibility is critical because none of our projects fit nicely into um, one category. We're trying to work with communities, understand what their needs are, and we talk to them about what a um, successful project uh, looks like for them, 
and incorporate all of those different aspects into the projects that we do. And so flexibility with the funding allows us to be nimble and make sure that we're not just doing one type of project one way, that we can uh, truly partner with communities and meet their needs as well as the regional transportation needs that the state is focused on. Well, thank you so much. Um, with the little bit of time remaining, I would just ask our governors uh, to uh, respond perhaps uh, during in the context of the next questioner uh, to the issue of uh, the permitting processes. Uh, are there opportunities to improve the federal permitting processes to expedite completing infrastructure projects? Um, I, uh, you don't have sufficient time within my five minutes to respond. Uh, so I will just thank you, uh, Governor Whitmer and Governor Hogan, uh, for uh, participating in this hearing and for your work on behalf of your states. Uh, having come out of state government, I'm deeply appreciative of the work that governors do. Uh, and thank you very much, all four of you, for participating in this hearing today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Senator, thank you. Um, and I would ask our governors to re just respond to Senator Lummis' question for the record and share that with all of us, please. Um, Senator uh, Lummis uh, was, was state treasurer at one time, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And uh, I think um, I, I think uh, you came close to running for governor, maybe did run for governor, didn't you? Well, I came close. Uh, I did serve as general counsel to our governor uh, once upon a time, and our current governor, uh, uh, you know, I, I suspect, and work within the National Governors Association, a uh, great guy, and I salute governors for their hard work, especially during COVID. This has been extremely challenging for all of you. Thank you for your leadership. I, I just mentioned all this. We got some extraordinary uh, uh, backgrounds uh, in terms of experience, levels of experience, and different kinds of jobs that our members have, uh, have held, and it's um, something we can take full, full advantage of. Um, next is uh, Senator uh, Markley, who used to be my seatmate on the uh, Senate floor. He left me about two weeks ago. Uh, so he's still on our side. <laughs> he's, he's sitting uh, about 20 feet away now. But Jeff, um, uh, you're, uh, you're uh, recognized. I think you're on uh, WebEx. And I think after you, Senator Markey. And after, sure. after uh, Senator sure. Markey, you'll be Senator Duckworth, Senator oh. Stabenow, uh, uh, and maybe Senator Kelly before Senator Stabenow, I think. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. But um, uh, Senator Merkley, you're, you're up. Thank you. Chair Carper, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you all. And I wanted to start uh, with a question to Mayor uh, Hancock. I know that Denver last year enacted its EV action plan, which uh, addressed in part uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, and I think part of the, the strategy was to create um, more charging infrastructure in underserved communities. It's, so maybe you could just share what the goal was and, and what you've learned in the last few months, what challenges you see ahead. Thank you, Senator, and I appreciate your question. The EV Action Plan was about uh, exactly as you're alluding to, the, the proliferation of charging stations around the city, uh, with particular focus on communities uh, to bridge the, the challenges around equity. Uh, we did a couple things. One, we changed our zoning code for any new buildings and housing units would have charging stations available to them, or at least the charging infrastructure would be available uh, for, for the creation of that. But we also, as a city, started looking at our public facilities, uh, our parks, um, our recreation centers um, that we own, and began the process of funding um, it, this installation of charging stations. We have it already at our airport, for example, uh, but these facilities that are much more readily available to underserved communities uh, would be available to them as well, uh, as well as uh, at our meters, some of our meter stations or our meter uh, locations around downtown Denver or wherever meters are located, we would also have some charging stations available to that. So we began in the last uh, 18 months or two years, began the process of rolling out that infrastructure, making the appropriate investments. Uh, we are really beginning the process of ramping up more of that, but we are making progress under that. I can get back to you in terms of the, the actual movement toward the, the particular goal. Uh, we'll make sure we get that to you from our staff, but uh, I am pleased with where we are and the fact that we've laid the foundations uh, for new builds to make sure that that is available to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And I, I see it as one of those plans that advances uh, climate by encouraging uh, movement to uh, electric vehicles. 
uh, but it also helps address um, uh, environmental and, and economic uh, justice. So uh, I'll look forward to more information. And speaking of uh, economic justice, I wanted to turn to Biden's pledge to ensure that 40% of the benefits from the infrastructure package are put forth to disadvantage uh, communities, communities that have been disinvested in. Uh, Mayor Hancock, do you support Biden's 40% uh, pledge? I do. And I think if you look more closely at a lot of the, on the local level, a lot of us, the cities are already focused on doing exactly that. Um, uh, we have in Denver a new equity strategy. I opened up a new uh, a sustainability office of sustainable, equitable uh, innovation and sustainability to make sure that we are advancing the goals of equity in everything that we do, including our contracting. Of course, we must do disparity studies to demonstrate the underserved uh, and the underutilization, uh, but we are absolutely committed to that, and I think uh, Thank President Biden's goal is right on target. Thank you. I wanted to ask the same question of our other colleagues, but uh, to just get a very short response because so I can move forward to another question. But Governor Whitmer, do you also support the 40% the uh, dedication to disadvantaged communities? I do think that it's important that we have equity built into all of these policies. And what we have seen in transition is that that hasn't always been the case and communities have been left behind. And so this is something that I think is crucial in our deliberations and should be embedded in the policy work that that comes out on this front and and frankly many others and of course part of the goal is sometimes it's easy in theory but it's hard in practice uh, because those same communities may have less political power which is why the the 40 percent is there is not just a commitment to the ideal but to the well let's actually make it happen uh, and uh, governor hogan uh, do you support that same 40 percent uh, uh, fraction well, in our state, I think we more than 50% of our uh, uh, transportation investment goes into uh, disadvantaged communities and minority uh, equity uh, types of issues because we're mostly focused on the, uh, the urban areas and the areas that immediately surround them. I haven't seen uh, President uh, Biden's proposal yet, uh, frankly, but tomorrow, uh, both the Secretary of Transportation and the President will be joining all of the nation's governors, and we look forward to... Uh, hearing more details about their plans with respect to transportation. Hey, Governor, one of the reasons, uh, and really something that I, I felt was important to raise is because I was in DC when the Metro system was built and Anacostia was, was left out because it was the, the black neighborhood that had little political powers. The green line didn't get built for ever. Uh, and then similarly in Maryland, uh, the red line has the same national reputation as a line that was planned to connect low-income black neighborhoods with few jobs to job centers and to also develop transit oriented development in those disinvested black neighborhoods and to improve the air quality that was bad because of the amount of traffic congestion and associated pollution. And But that is a project you chose to cancel and put the funds instead in predominantly white communities. So would a 40% pledge like this help on projects, make sure projects like the red line in Baltimore actually happen uh, to serve such disinvested communities. Well, uh, Senator, I would, I would totally disagree with your uh, assertion for a number of reasons, but we don't have time to uh, debate that here this morning. Uh, the red line, according to the Washington Post editorial board, never made any economic or transportation sense. Uh, it, it, our transportation department recommended against it. But we did move forward on the Purple Line, which goes through Prince George's County. It's a 16 stops in minority communities and ties, uh, ties into the metro system, which I came up with a funding stream to, uh, to try to keep uh, functioning when there wasn't enough federal investment. Well, it sounds like you uh, on, that, on that point, I think we're going to have to. So we're out of time. Conclude. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks for those uh, questions, uh, Senator Mark, and for the responses as well. Uh, Senator Markey, um, you're up, my friend. On uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much, and uh, thank you to our great panel, which is joining us today. Um, we're obviously at a, a crossroads in terms of our relationship with um, greenhouse gases and the impact they have on uh, minority communities, communities of color, uh, historically disadvantaged communities, uh, and, uh, and the role the United States must play uh, in finding the solutions and uh, and exporting those solutions around the rest of the planet. So th that's why this hearing is so important. And obviously governors play a huge role, mayors play a huge role uh, in helping to set 
the, the course for where we have to go. Uh, we have to think big, we have to act big, we're running out of time uh, to deal with the, um, with the climate change crisis uh, and the transportation sector is uh, a central part of the solutions. Um, so uh, I, I've introduced uh, a, a bill called the Green Streets Act uh, with Senator Copper um, that will, and other members of the committee, uh, and that bill would require very strong standards uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled for transportation planning and projects. And I'm also uh, introducing today the Freezer Trucks Act to help replace diesel powered refrigerated trucks with cleaner electric um, versions in overburdened communities as well in Massachusetts and Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is our poorest community. We have diesel trucks just idling all day long uh, near the most uh, vulnerable communities that already have the highest levels of asthma and the highest levels of coronavirus because of their uh, obvious pre-existing uh, vulnerability uh, because they're both lung diseases. So Governor Whitmer, can you, can you talk about the future, you know, uh, as you see it, of the, the new announcement by General Motors and other automotive companies to move to 100% electric vehicles by 2035, uh, what that might mean in terms of uh, this partnership that we can have with the states to ensure that we telescope the time frame to reach a day where we have a new fleet, jobs are being created by the millions, and at the same time, uh, we're making sure that those who are most vulnerable are being protected. Absolutely, Senator Markey, it's good to see you and I'm, I appreciate the question. And um, I'm gonna have to pre-apologize for, this will have to be my last question. I've gotta go give my uh, press conference on, on our updates about what's happening in the state. So I'm glad for an opportunity to ask, answer this question though. Uh, last year I created the Council on Future Mobility and Electrification and it was intentional to bring uh, diverse stakeholders together to help build a mobility strategy for Michigan and help identify where opportunities for growth and improvement are. With those stakeholders, we're working to build an electric vehicle charging network that connects the entire state by 2030 and hopefully connect with other networks across the Midwest. And I can tell you, I was on the call last night with a number of my colleagues from the Midwest and we are thinking about ways that we can collaborate this moment has brought us together in, in ways we couldn't have imagined, but there are opportunities out of this that we are already talking about. Significant investments in our electric grid, renewable energy and charging infrastructure to ensure reliability and drive the market for EVs um, to address issues like range anxiety as we talked about earlier in this hearing. Over the past two years, between state and local dollars, our utility providers, our auto manufacturers, We've invested millions in electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which is really important. And it's, we've got some of the, the most in the Midwest. In addition to this though, we've got to lead by example and increase the number of electric vehicles in our state and federally controlled fleets. Um, tax incentives should be reviewed, I believe, to uh, more useful, to, you know, to be more useful for commercial fleet owners as fleets represent the greatest near-term commercial opportunity for large scale deployment of electric vehicles. And then building up a network of publicly available charging stations um, that are capable of serving medium and heavy duty vehicles to your idling comment. I think that's particularly important. So my state is looking to take a lead um, in doing a lot of this here in the Midwest, uh, but certainly this is something that's important for our entire nation. The program that we've developed is looking to take applications for partnerships um, through the Charging Infrastructure Grant Program. And with our, our new Office of Future Mobility and Electrification, with our Department of um, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, uh, we're working alongside industry partners. And, and that's, I think, really important. As we tackle this problem, um, we've got a much greater uh, odds of success if we are bringing in partners from all different spaces to to solve this problem. And it'll be good for the job front, it'll be good for the climate problems that we're having and good for our economy. No, thank you, Governor. And, and I do believe that uh, Michigan in a lot of ways is gonna be at the center of the leadership. Uh, and thank you for your great 
of work and your vision on these issues. We can we can create millions. We can save all of creation while engaging in massive job creation uh, in the automotive sector and in other sectors of our economy. And it's just important for us to continue to deliver that message uh, that uh, this is a job creation uh, a moment and that the UAW, the auto industry is signing up, but so isn't, uh, and, and that's you know something that we have to focus on. We have to focus on the you know freezer trucks, diesel fuels, uh, others that don't oftentimes get to be a part of this conversation, uh, but which necessarily have to be uh, if we're gonna solve the whole program. But thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Governor, for your great work. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. And, and, Thank and, you, and Senator. if I may, okay, it, 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 has my time expired? It is more than expired. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Whitmer, uh, rather, Governor Whitmer, thanks so much for being a part of uh, our uh, panel today. This terrific panel, and we have a couple of uh, more of our colleagues who have questions to ask, and we appreciate the other three panelists staying on board. But Governor uh, Whitmer, I just say that the, when the baseball team has the, the worst record in baseball, uh, they get the top uh, draft choices, and uh, hope springs eternal for our Tigers. And they've got some great, great young arms, and I look forward to maybe seeing a game with you and uh, Debbie and uh, and Gary, someday, someday soon. All right. Let's thanks do it. Th thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and next, uh, we have Senator Duckworth. Senator Duckworth. And after uh, Senator Duckworth, uh, Senator Sabra, and then Senator Kelly, and then maybe some words from um, Senator Kelly. We'll wrap it up, and and uh, and, I'll, and and we're going to work uh, Lindsey Graham into this. Uh, some some some. <laughs> All right, good enough. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Carper. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Uh, Just fine wonderful. I appreciate your leadership in making sure our committee's top priority is passing a comprehensive infrastructure package that rebuilds our roads, rail, and transit systems. Of course, if we are truly to build back better uh, in Congress, we need to do a lot more work. Um, we need to also prioritize drinking water and wastewater infrastructure in any proposal. After all, there's one fact of life that ties all of us together is the absolute necessity for safe and reliable water systems. It's long overdue for Congress to place as much importance on what is built underground as we do on above ground projects that all can see. I also believe in the dig once and we're going to fix the roads, might as well fix the sewer systems while you're at it. Unfortunately, years of neglect have created a crisis that this Congress must solve. EPA estimates that to deliver safe drinking water to every household in America, we would have to invest half a trillion dollars over the next 20 years to maintain or upgrade our pipes, storage tanks, and treatment facilities. Let me just let that, let, let, let that sink in a little bit. Half a trillion dollars, uh, 500 billion over two decades. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, I, I would like to also send this to Governor Whitmer. But um, uh, Governor Hogan, I hope that you'll be able to um, uh, address this issue first. Do you agree that water infrastructure should be a centerpiece of our Build Back Better efforts? And second, could you discuss how robust federal investments in state and local water systems would help create jobs, foster economic growth, and most importantly, protect the health and safety of your constituents? Is Governor Hogan? Uh, uh, Senator Duckworth, uh, Governor Whitmer had to uh, to leave for another event, and so she. No, I knew. Yes, I was saying that um, if Governor Hogan could also address it. Oh, that's great. Okay, Governor Hogan, you're you're bad and clean up here. <laughs> it was really to both governors. <laughs> okay, Governor Hogan, are you there? Earth calling, Governor Hogan. Okay. I can go to Mayor Hancock. I have a question for Mayor Hancock as well. All right, let's do that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mayor Hancock, it's estimated that Chicago drivers lose 138 hours each year due to congestion, a tremendous loss of productivity that I'm confident is also experienced in communities across our nation. That is why one of my top priorities is making sure our forthcoming reauthorization proposal treats reducing roadway congestion as the national priority it is for the millions of Americans who are stuck driving to work every day. I'm, conf I'm confident we can build broad bipartisan support of these efforts as evidenced by the inclusion of my proposal to establish a comp competitive congestion relief grant program in the surface transportation bill that our committee favorably reported last Congress. 
Mayor Hancock, can you explain how authorizing a congressional relief grant program would help local governments like Denver advance innovative roadway congestion solutions? Thank you, Senator Duckworth, and uh, appreciate your question. Yeah, I believe that, you know, with regards to people taking other modes of transportation, you have to offer, um, you know, just as many or more uh, competitive driving options or options for them than driving alone. Um, our single occupancy rate in Denver was over 73%, and that is just unsustainable in a city that was growing as fast as the city of Denver. So it is important that we offer options that give them the reliability, the predictability, and of course, cost um, and efficiency as well uh, for them to choose different modes of transportation or to have a multi uh, occupancy within a vehicle or a multi occupancy in a mode. Uh, there should be focused on uh, different modes and options for, for municipalities rather than simply building highways or streets. And that's why we're focused in Denver on things such as bike lanes and transit um, and, and other uh, modes that move people, moving people and not just vehicles. And so we absolutely agree with what you found in Chicago and recognize that until we get serious about that, uh, we will never, in terms of creating options that make sense for people uh, that are just as competitive in driving alone, uh, we won't be able to break through on this challenge of congestion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to go ahead and uh, submit my previous question for the record for the for the uh, two uh, governors. Um, they have answer in writing. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be fine. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. A any uh, any other comments, questions, Senator? No, I yield back. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today. We've also been joined by Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, who. Uh, I know from experience has a, a real interest in some of the issues that we're talking about here today, even though he was not a member of the committee, goes way, way back years ago. And Lindsay, we were happy you've joined us and, and, and welcome. You're uh, recognized and will be followed by Senator Stavros, Senator Kelly, and last but not least, Senator Padilla. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you and uh, Senator Capto. This is, uh, you know, this is, should be the most bipartisan committee because we all need roads and bridges and all that kind of good stuff. So I'll make a comment, then I'll ask a question. I think we've got a high, highway trust fund shortfall, increase in gasoline taxes, maybe a necessary idea. But what I want to share my thoughts with the committee is about the future. Uh, our friends in Michigan, they tell me that most cars being made in the future are going to be electric, not gasoline driven. So G General Motors said by 2035, they will do away with their uh, gasoline operated vehicles. That is a major societal change. So whatever we do with the trust fund, we need to capture the fact that most cars by the middle of the century, but 2050, probably won't run on gasoline. That'd be good for the environment, but it will certainly uh, require us to put new infrastructure in place and redesign the trust fund. So what I'd like to do as we try to reauthorize the current system is to put some money aside to develop uh, the infrastructure of the future. I think drones are gonna be more available when it comes to transporting um, material. I think trucks are probably gonna be not just electric, maybe hydrogen vehicles uh, in, in terms of long haul trucking. Um, so the bottom line is if it's true that the gasoline driven car is going to be less plentiful on the road by the middle of the century, and maybe the dominant mode of transportation will be something other than gasoline, we need to start now redesigning the trust fund. And we need to start now plowing money into infrastructure consistent with a new way of uh, transportation. And if it's true that most cars in the future are gonna have a driverless component, Seems to me we should be investing in the technology to make it as safe as possible. So the only thing I want to add to what's been said is the future. Let's take an opportunity in 2021 to start laying the ground uh, work for a more sustainable trust fund in terms of the way vehicles are going to be changing from uh, gasoline to electric. Let's look at the emergence of driverless vehicles and try to make them safer, quicker. If we can own this space in the 21st century as America and develop this technology and sell it around the world to be one of the biggest things we've ever done as a nation, I think, since maybe developing the car itself. 
So I don't know who we have as witnesses left, but here's a question to anybody out there. In your states, do you have a plan to deal with the fact that there's going to be more non-gasoline driven cars on your roads? And have you embraced the idea that the driverless vehicle is coming sooner rather than later? And what thoughts do you have about how to accommodate these changes? And what plans do you have to capture money for the trust fund from non-gasoline driven cars in your state or your city? So whoever's out there, that's my question. I think we still have a mayor and I think we still have a commissioner out there. So okay. but ladies we'll, first, please. We'll start with the two that we got. <laughs> mayor? Commissioner, go ahead. I, I, yes, I'll yield to Matt. Senator Graham, I appreciate your remarks. We as state DOT leaders are very excited about the opportunity um, of connected and automated vehicles. And um, we also have been preparing, uh, building out our EV charging infrastructure and planning for the future. If you don't mind, what it's percentage funny. of cars in your state are electric vehicles at this point? It's a relatively low percentage. It's only approximately 4%, I believe, as of this time. Um, however, we're seeing that number increase um, year over year. And so um, here in New Hampshire, we established an electric vehicle charging commission. Um, all of the state agencies have been supporting the legislature. Similar to the programs that were discussed um, earlier in Michigan and other parts of the country, uh, we're trying to bring all of the stakeholders to the table uh, to make sure that we understand at what rate uh, things will change. But most importantly, um, we do want to uh, reassure the consumer that if they were to purchase an electric vehicle, um, there is the infrastructure to support um, them moving freely within the state, especially when it comes to visitors. Uh, New Hampshire's economy um, is really um, driven uh, by travel and tourism, and so we want to uh, ensure that uh, visitors to our state uh, don't have that anxiety either about what infrastructure is available to them. Um, but you also touched on uh, connected and automated technologies. You know, in 2019, there was over 36,000 individuals lost on our nation's roads. That statistic is incredibly troubling. And the promise that connected and automated vehicles uh, bring and uh, those opportunities to ensure that there are, uh, as we work to the future, truly zero deaths on our system. Um, those are initiatives that state DOTs are excited uh, to work on. And um, we're preparing for the future. Um, our state legislatures are asking us to look at our existing uh, state statutes, our administrative rules, our design criteria, and make sure that we are um, addressing um, the regulatory aspect um, of our work. And that's not a barrier to being able to deploy these technologies quickly and effectively. Yeah. And uh, Senator Graham's time is expired. I, I still want the mayor to respond briefly to, yeah. to his question. Mayor, if you, so mayor, if you could do that, that'd seconds, be great. Uh, Thanks. Sorry to go over here. That's sure. Senator Graham, I can respond in 30 seconds. Let me submit, if you don't mind. First of all, I appreciate your, your comments and your thoughts about the future. I want to submit that we're already behind the rest of the world. And all you have to do is leave our coast and, and, and go to a different country and find that the technology is uh, advancing in terms of electrification, uh, electric use of electric vehicles. The real challenge, of course, is the lack of supply. More uh, our automakers are rolling out more electric vehicles, so that's critical. And then secondly, it's a cost. Um, and we got to make sure we get it down so that there's some equity within the system. And then finally, of course, is the infrastructure. We lack infrastructure. Right? Let me submit that we talked about, or at least I suggested, the renewal of the energy efficiency block grant. That would be critical to help states and cities to proliferate charging stations and the infrastructure around our states. And if I could just add one last thing to your list in terms of looking to the future, um, that is the urban air uh, tra uh, travel uh, system. Uh, within urban areas, we very soon you won't be on services. We have technology today that can move people uh, without being on the ground, uh, and, and we need to begin to prepare for that as well. S S Senator uh, uh, Graham, your question is prescient, and uh, remember the old movie Back to the Future? Uh, we, uh, earlier in the, the, uh, the hearing, we talked a little bit about the last bill that we uh, 
passed out of here unanimously. Uh, I think it was 21 to no nothing. Uh, Five-year reauthorization. Included in the, that reauthorization was a 50-state uh, pilot on vehicle miles traveled. We've are, so far done about six or seven states' pilots for, for vehicle miles traveled. And I describe that as, as part of the future for f transportation funding, maybe eventually the, the principal for, uh, place. But we're still going to have a bunch of cars and trucks and vans on, as you know, on the road, because people keep vehicles about an average of 10 or 11 years, so they're going to be around for a while. And, uh, but thank you. It's great having you on, on the committee. Welcome, uh, welcome aboard. Um, next, Senator Stabenow. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And when we're talking about electric vehicles, I certainly feel like uh, we're in the Michigan wheelhouse. So, um, and I, I appreciate so much uh, Governor Whitmer uh, being with us this morning as well as Governor Hogan. Let me just add to the discussion on this. Uh, I couldn't agree more that we have to look at our financing around uh, transportation given where we are going. And I would also say this, that our companies are investing tens of billions of dollars on the future right now. They cannot get there without a partnership with us. Um, China has invested $100 billion to get ahead of us to not only uh, own the technology. I mean, part of this, to build these new vehicles, to plant the plants that have to be opened, we are going to need a number of battery cell plants to be able to deal with the new technology and the parts that are needed. This is very exciting because we have all kinds of new clean energy jobs in manufacturing to give us the supply chain to be able to do it. But China is already doing it. They're already out there trying to own all of this, as well as the charging infrastructure, as well as all of it. So we really are in a race, a competitive race, that we can win. Right now, the majority of the expertise and technology is in America, but it won't be unless we are partnering with them to get there. And so I would just say we, we not only um, charging stations critical, we've got to deal with range anxiety, we've got to deal with how folks feel they can drive across the country on these, in these wonderful new vehicles, not only small vehicles, but your F-150 truck is going to be all electric, Mr. Chairman, coming next year with Ford. So uh, we have, uh, as well as all kinds of others, I could do ads for all kinds of uh, vehicles. Uh, but the other thing I would say, until we get uh, the, to the price point for consumers as well, the consumer uh, tax credit that we have had in place that is now running out needs to be uh, continued for a piece of time until we get the volume up. It's like any other kind of technology. Till there's enough purchasing power um, you don't see the price go down. So electric vehicles, the, the, the cost points, and having the supply chain to be able to do this. So I just have one question as we conclude. I appreciate very much our, all of our witnesses, but I, I want to ask uh, Ms. Sheehan, um, from your uh, stand, uh, uh, vantage point as president of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, um, if Congress were able to meet the entirety of the investment backlog, you've indicated there's um, the investment backlog is $836 billion for highways and bridges and $122 billion for transit. If somehow we could reach all of that or reduce it substantially, what would that mean to uh, economic growth as we come out of the economic crisis in the pandemic? Well, thank you, Senator. First and foremost, it would create immediate economic uh, stimulus across the country. Jobs in transportation are good paying jobs. And given the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, investing in infrastructure will truly help us build back better. Further to that, we as state DOTs are in the business of asset management. We want to make the most financially sound investments in our infrastructure, reducing the life cycle cost of operating that infrastructure. And so if we could address the backlog and move forward um, in a way that uh, we can maintain the existing system in a good state of repair, that will save taxpayers uh, money into the future. When we allow things to fall apart, it can cost four times to 10 times as much to build uh, the infrastructure back and have it in a good state of repair. And so as uh, 
the owners of this infrastructure trying to manage it as effectively as possible. We really uh, want to address that backlog and then move forward uh, in a new day uh, with a much more efficient way to maintain our systems. But more than that, I talked about the, the high number of uh, fatalities on our systems. These investments would save lives. Uh, we'd be making long term safety improvements, we'd be improving quality of life for communities, building sidewalks and bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, that are fun, fantastic ways to stimulate ep economic activity in downtown areas. Um, and we'd be addressing um, different uh, aspects of quality of life, improving access and opportunity for every American. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say that one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be on this committee is that I think this committee has the opportunity to fundamentally change the future for our country and for yeah. our citizens. And uh, this is a huge part of it. So thank you. I, I, Senator Stefan, I think you and Senator Kelly, Senator Padilla, and, and uh, Senator Graham are really smart because you joined this committee at a time when we can work on um, job creation at a time where we very much need it, when we can work on uh, uh, improving the air quality that we breathe, we can work on climate change, uh, we can just do so many good things. And we work on equity issues, and uh, it's, uh, you're going to make a good committee better, but this is, this is a great time to be on this committee. So thank you for joining us. All right, Mark, my friend, uh, welcome aboard. Captain, you're recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm uh, pleased to be on this committee uh, as well. And this question is for Commissioner Sheehan um, about NEPA reviews. So I frequently hear uh, concerns from transportation planners in Arizona um, about the limitations on when and how NEPA approvals can be completed. As you are aware, current guidelines from the Federal Highways Administration prevent states from making NEPA approval decisions on projects that are not included in a statewide or metro transportation plan. And in most cases, federal funding cannot be used to complete a NEPA review of the project, which places a increased burden on state and local planning agencies. Arizona has a number of large transportation projects which are preparing for costly tier two environmental impact statement assessments, including a project to expand uh, uh, Highway I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson. There's another project called the Sonoran Corridor Project in Tucson and the I-11 project, which could finally, and this is a big deal, finally connect Phoenix and Las Vegas via an interstate highway. These projects and projects like them throughout the country deserve to have thorough environmental reviews that allow affected communities with the opportunity to provide some feedback. Yet, cost constraints and requirements that states and localities Fully fund these reviews slows the process of getting these projects off the ground. That delays efforts to make infrastructure upgrades needed in Arizona and across the country. So, Commissioner Sheehan, as this committee considers surface transit reauthorization legislation, what steps can we take now to ensure transportation planners have the resources and flexibilities for, to produce high quality? timely and accurate environmental reviews while preventing delays to the overall transportation planning process? So first and foremost, providing adequate funding. Um, if these projects have that dedicated uh, stream of funding, then it is much easier to move them forward. And so um, making sure that we have the resources, these projects can be included in our long-term uh, transportation plans and that everyone understands they are truly priorities to our states. Um, but beyond that, I believe we're up to eight states that currently um, have taken ownership of NEPA reviews. Uh, this provides them uh, the opportunity to significantly streamline the delivery of their projects. As an example, I think California was the first state uh, to pursue this. Um, they're taking on that liability of ensuring their projects are in full compliance with all federal regulations. But in return for that, um, it, it expedites the advancement of those projects because we're not submitting documents to other agencies for their review and feedback. Um, we're 
ensuring full compliance uh, internally at our respective state DOTs. And so continuing to advocate uh, for those types of changes where the states who are willing to can step up and take on more responsibility, um, but in no way circumvent um, or fail to meet their environmental uh, commitments and obligations. Commissioner, is, is New Hampshire one of those eight states? We have not uh, moved in that direction as of yet, but it's certainly something that we're exploring, uh, seeing the tremendous success across uh, the rest of the country. Well, thank you. That, that's uh, very helpful. And uh, Mr. Chairman, you were mentioning, you know, songs earlier, and I think the appropriate song might be the Rascal Flats, Life is a Highway, appropriate today. And I yield back the remainder of my time. All right. Always great to hear the Rascal Flats. That's good. All right, uh, Alex, I think you're, you're on. Senator Padilla, new member from uh, California. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does this make me the cleanup hitter? It does. You know. Thank you for uh, the welcome to the committee, uh, eager uh, for a lot of great work to be done this session. Uh, I'll, I have two related topics I want to touch on. So if uh, I may, Mr. Chair, I'll get through both questions and uh, acknowledge who they're addressed to, uh, and then sit back and hear the answers for both. Uh, first, uh, on the topic of uh, resiliency and uh, disaster preparedness. Uh, it's not just uh, California's recent record wildfire seasons, plural, uh, not in a good way, of course, uh, but uh, severe flooding across uh, various parts of the country to recent events in Texas. We've seen uh, in recent years how the climate crisis is leading to more dangerous uh, and more numerous natural disasters. So as we work to address this reality, we must improve the resiliency of our roads, our bridges, uh, and our infrastructure writ large to adapt to and recover from extreme weather events. I know Governor Whitmer is no longer with us, but uh, uh, she in her written testimony spoke to many of the roads that were washed out due to recent floods in Michigan. So let me just address this question then to Commissioner Sheehan, who also mentioned in her written testimony how uh, the department uses federal dollars to carry out a significant number of resiliency projects. I understand that AASHTO has supported recent efforts by this committee to improve system resiliency, including by expanding project eligibility for the National Highway Performance Program, the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, and the Emergency Relief Program. So I'd love for the commissioner to touch on the importance of resiliency projects for planning and what steps this committee can take uh, in the upcoming reauthorization bill to support state's efforts to improve resiliency in transportation systems. The other question, uh, more related than you may think, uh, is for Mayor Hancock. Uh, while the national highway system connects cities and facilitates economic activity across the nation, its construction historically has been deeply destructive for many communities, particularly lower income communities and communities of color. The construction of highways through some neighborhoods has caused the displacement of predominantly uh, minority residents and in many cases fosters isolation from opportunity, heightened exposure to pollution and chronic disinvestment. Mayor Hancock in his written testimony uh, spoke to concerns about equity uh, and equity considerations going into planning efforts and specific examples of not just Denver's experience in the past, but how Denver is now working in partnership with the state of Colorado to reconnect communities in the reconstruction of Interstate 70, which bisects the city. So we'd love for the mayor to speak to how this can serve as a model for reconnecting communities in other cities across the country. And once again, how the federal government can play a bigger role in supporting projects that uh, mitigate the detrimental impact of highways on historically disenfranchised communities. Thank you both. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, as part of the development of our transportation asset management plans, uh, state DOTs are required to do a risk and hazards analysis. Many of us have been uh, working to build out our GIS information. When we have significant storm events in our states, 
we're mapping exactly which uh, locations on our transportation system were impacted by those events and making sure that in the future, as we are advancing improvements in those locations, we're incorporating resiliency and ensuring that the impacts from prior storms are not allowed to occur in the future. And so we've really integrated resiliency into every aspect of the work that we do. And from, from day one, when we're scoping a project, we're looking at that history of where we have um, seen significant impacts, especially from flooding, um, either in coastal areas or inland when we have significant rain events, um, and making sure that we build it back better. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Mayor? Senator, I'm sorry, with regards to your question around the I-70 project and, of course, the issues of equity, it was when the City of Denver got involved in this conversation about the I-70 project that we were able to bring um, to like the values of equity. This highway was placed, as you pointed out, in a primarily minority low-income community, dividing the community, creating barriers and lack of investment um, for the foregoing future. We had some options available, but none that would, um, you know, that were quite frankly feasible in going forward. So there was a few things that the city of Denver brought forward as a municipality who understood the challenges that this community faced, as well as the historical uh, actions of uh, environmental injustice. One was community engagement. The FHWA said this was probably the model uh, effort around community engagement they have ever seen. And we're proud of that, but to engage the community, to hear the voice of people who live there, but also to understand the history was very important. Empowering the, the government, local government to engage. The, the State Department of Transportation really helped us to, by allowing us, open us, open the door for us to be involved. We can bring forward the issues of, of uh, equity and, and opportunity. Connecting roads in that community that would uh, help provide new life of opportunity was also increasingly important as we moved in, as well as amenities. These were underserved communities. They didn't have access to parks. And as part of this highway project, we lowered it and we're capping it with a new park for the community that everyone can enjoy. And we are also building in, we built in some remedies to some of the environmental challenges, including pollution, but also flooding, helping to remedy the flooding, the historic flooding of these neighborhoods in a project called Plot to Park. And we, have, we, we merged two very important but very expensive infrastructure programs, including this project, to alleviate the, fun, the flooding of these neighborhoods that have been happening for hundreds of years um, and, and, and make it more, um, quite frankly, improve the quality of life of residents in the area. So the Platte Park program was extremely important. And so making sure that you're engaging municipalities who have, again, a better understanding of, of, of the residents the challenges of equity, the environmental injustices that have occurred, and having created opportunities around connectivity and new renewed opportunities of investment was critically important on the I-70 project. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Padilla, thank you for uh, some great questions there. I, I'm going to uh, yield now to uh, Senator Capito, and she'll uh, give some closing statements and then hand the gavel back to me. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, our witnesses. I thought they were tremendous, gave us great insight and a broad uh, understanding of how many of these programs in impact their communities, their states, and I appreciate, I know it's been a, a little bit lengthy for some. Uh, I also would like to call attention to the fact that we had almost unanimous membership here in our committee asking questions and engaging in this issue. And I think if you closed your eyes and, and didn't know who was asking the questions or from what party that person might be from, I, I think you see that there's a solidarity of interest and uh, a, a grand desire to, to really get something done together uh, in the, in the uh, surface transportation and infrastructure area. Uh, the variety of questions, uh, whether it's formula funding or electric vehicles or uh, bridge repair or, uh, you know, kind of cuts across every, every single state. We know that. Every state has more urban areas and, and uh, lots of rural areas. And, and so I think that uh, the perspectives that uh, all, of our, all of our members have given us uh, show that uh, the, the great uh, interest that we all have in making sure that our state's needs are, uh, are addressed. Uh, I said in my beginning statement that uh, flexibility was going to be very important. I think the governor's backed me up on that. Uh, what uh, a one-size-fits-all doesn't work for Denver, that might work for Maryland, that might work for West Virginia. And so the flexibility built into the program is really critical. One of the areas that uh, I think uh, we had, uh, I think, good 
um, uh, agreement on is the uh, the speed to projects, uh, the um, the delivery of the actual project, and that uh, I talked in my opening statements about the seven year timeline uh, and how that's uh, costly and and may result in obviously fewer jobs, but also maybe incomplete projects or projects that are only partially able to be completed and therefore uh, not as useful and not as uh, critical to the infrastructure development of our uh, individual states. Certainty is something that we've all uh, asked for, uh, and that would be the predictability of a lengthy bill, uh, five or six year bill, which I think provides the certainty that many folks talked about. Innovation was a huge topic. We heard a lot about electric vehicle uh, charging stations, which we had in our, our bill. We had the first climate chapter uh, ever in a highway bill that we passed 21 to nothing. Uh, we're very much committed to that on a bipartisan basis, uh, and we want to make sure that it's um, um, that it's uh, in the best interests of uh, everybody for the environmental uh, reasons as well as the uh, infrastructure development regions. Um, I will say that we did ha hear a lot about. I thought it was interesting to hear uh, from the different topics about electric, and when you're talking about electric vehicle charging stations, how the different municipalities and states, you know, they're not waiting for the federal government to fill the gap here. And uh, I'm sure that there's ways that we can help, but at the same time, we need to be relying on the, uh, uh, the resources that are available on the local and state level. They're ready to commit resources and have, and certainly from the private sector, you know, we don't want to displace that commitment, I don't think, with a federal commitment, because we're going to have enough on our plate without without uh, co-opting where our states and, and municipalities are already willing to go with the private sector. So I would say with all the electric vehicles that are being projected to be on our roads, the main thing is we got to have safe highways. We have to have modernized highways. We have to have bridges that are safe. We have to go back to the core function of a surface transportation bill. Not to say we're not going to build transportation for the future, because we will, but we have to have the, there's always those, it's almost like the food and water aspects of our lives. There are basic things that we have to have as we move towards different parts of our society in different ways. And certainly our job I see with all the great things that we see in our future, we still have that core function. And that's where I think you saw a lot of interest from our uh, committee. So I think you did a great job. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, with great witnesses, and I'm just glad to participate. I want to thank my staff. They, they got us all prepared, and, and your staff as well. Uh, we're, working, we're working well together. Let's keep it up. Oh, he wants the gavel back. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and uh, in closing, I, I want to just follow up. This has been uh, just a great hearing. What a great, uh, what a great hearing to start off uh, our, our new Congress. And I think we've had uh, all but uh, two of our members were able to participate, which is terrific attendance. And I know everybody has other committees and other hearings that they're trying to, to, to get to. So thanks uh, to, uh, to our, our uh, colleagues and a warm welcome to, uh, to our, our new colleagues who were here today. Um, I want to say a special thanks to our staffs. We, uh, uh, I, I used to admire the way uh, Max Bacchus and Chuck Grassley worked together in the Finance Committee. And they initially started by meeting, uh, just the two of them would meet maybe once a week. And then over time, they'd have like another, like a ch chief uh, of staff or something like that with them. And, uh, but eventually, you could walk into a meeting between their two staffs. Uh, Max Bach is a Democrat, uh, Chuck Grassley, a Republican on the Finance Committee, the two leads. And if you didn't know who was working for who, you wouldn't know. And I think that's, uh, that's a good goal for, 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 for us, and I'm encouraged that uh, that we're going to have some terrific uh, collaboration. I, I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, what a lineup! Our staffs. Thank you for bringing together four terrific witnesses, and we're uh, we're uh, deeply grateful to a couple of governors, uh, Governor Hogan, our neighbor uh, not far away in uh, in Maryland, and Governor Whitman, who's the governor of uh, my favorite baseball team, <laughs> Tigers, <laughs> and Mayor Hancock from Denver, and uh, Commissioner Sheehan uh, up in uh, up in New Hampshire. Uh, the uh, y'all did a, a wonderful job, and we appreciate your uh, joining us uh, virtually. And um, uh, I, I want to just say uh, one thing, in, in maybe one or two things in closing. That the uh, we're so lucky to be here. We're so lucky to serve on this committee. Of uh, I uh, 
I, I like to quote Einstein. Uh, Einstein used to say, in adversity lies opportunity. Plenty of adversity. I, I talked about it when we hit, uh, began the hearing. But there's also opportunity here. And, and if we're smart about it and, and uh, we find ways to, uh, to collaborate and work together, we're going uh, to rise to, to, the, to the occasion. I'm hopeful and, and encouraged that, 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 we, that we will. American people are counting on us. And uh, I got out, I said earlier at the beginning of the hearing, I got off the train, Union Station, and walked up to the Capitol. The uh, sun was out, the, uh, the uh, Capitol was so beautiful, the skies were blue, the sun shining in the Capitol. And I felt like morning in America again. And that's a good, uh, a good uh, note for us to, to, to close on. We have a couple of uh, unanimous consent requests, and I would ask uh, unanimous consent that um, to submit for the record a number of letters from associations focused on safety, electric charging, construction jobs, technology, and others. And they're all eager to see Congress get to work on infrastructure for the benefit of all the American people, and so are we. And uh, one other one, there's been a, a fair amount of discussion on, uh, uh, and rightly so, on delay. Uh, we've included uh, uh, streamlining provisions uh, in every reauthorization bill in the last 30 years. I know every one that I've I had a chance to work on. We also need to, to recognize the, the delays that are caused by funding shortfalls. That's something we can do something about, and, and we need to. I want to ask unanimous consent to submit, for the record, a report from AECOM, a consulting firm that looked at 40 major infrastructure projects and found that the major challenge to 39 out of 40 was inadequate funding, not completion of environmental reviews. So let's keep that in mind. I hope our next uh, bill will encourage innovation, innovative uh, project delivery and also address our funding shortfalls. We need to do both. And let me just ask yourself, is there anything else that uh, we need? No? All right. I think we're ready for takeoff. Yeah. It was a good, uh, a good day. Thanks, everyone.